Here. Present. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, I see we have the presentation all up, ready to go. Uh, for everyone who is listening and watching afar, uh, we are going to begin with uh, our presentation this morning. We have a very special guest here with us uh, today, one of our uh, former uh, colleagues, uh, Councilman Matt Zone, come on up and his team. Uh, the Development Plan and Sustainability Committee will receive an update from the Western Reserve Land Conservancy on the citywide property survey efforts and present their US EPA funded Cleave Lot Initiative, which aims to create a collaborative built, transparent, and accessible planning tool to accelerate vacant land reuse and advance environmental justice. We also will have our director, our other very special guest as well, Director Sally Martin for Building and Housing, come on up. All right, good morning, Director. Okay. All right, got your whole team. You need any more space? Good to go. All right. Um, followed by the presentation, we will hear the one, two, the four ordinances that we have listed on the calendar. Ordinance number 251, 282, 396, and 397. All right, committee, uh, good morning, everyone. And I'll turn it over to uh, Councilman Zone. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, uh, uh, the Land Concerns, he's honored and privileged to be before this uh, important uh, body of government. Um, I'd like to begin first just by introducing our team, and I'll go away to your left and to my right. Um, Kelly, why don't you grab the microphone. Uh, to my colleagues, uh, green is good, red is bad, so you have to press the button. Uh, just introduce your name and your title, please. Khalid Ali, Urban Green Space Coordinator. Tim Deem, Urban Revitalization Fellow. MK Hubbard, Urban Programs Administrator. Adrian Marty, uh, Manager of the Cleveland Property Survey. And Isaac Robb, Vice President of Planning and Urban Projects. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, before um, I uh, go into, we're, we're going to give a presentation on two citywide initiatives. Um, as you know, we are in the process of conducting a citywide property inventory for the city of Cleveland. Um, and I do want to acknowledge Director Martin's um, thoughtful thinking about this and approach. Um, as all council members know that for far too long, the city has been chasing code enforcement and doing it in, in a reactive way instead of a proactive way. And I know this was a huge priority for Director Martin when she came on board that she wanted to get a handle and an assessment on um, what was the inventory of the city. So, you know, at this time, I'd like to give Director Martin uh, just an opportunity to make a brief comment about the work we're doing and then we'll go into our presentation. Sure. Thank you. Through the chair of the committee, thank you for having us all here today. Um, I'm very pleased to say we're wrapping up the survey. Awesome. Um, Winter was very kind to us. We were very sure concerned with starting this in the mm -hmm. fall, but um, it was very fortunate, and we had a lot of hardworking surveyors made up of our own building and housing inspectors, um, our HHI inspectors, and some inspectors from MOCAP, and also from the Community Development Department. And I think what this is going to lend to the survey is an air of professionalism that may never have been there before. You know, these are professional people who are used to looking at violations in houses, and I think we're going to have an extremely comprehensive assessment of all of the stock, not just housing, but buildings, commercial structures throughout. Uh, we will be analyzing this data and doing a presentation for council once everything is compiled. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Martin. It's always um, good working with you. So through the chair to uh, members of council, the Land Conservancy is once again partnering with the City of Cleveland uh, to survey, assess, and analyze nearly 170,000 land parcels in and around the city. This is every single parcel. This is not only residential property, it's commercial, it's industrial, and it's vacant land. And in the presentation, you'll see the extensive um, questionnaire that is being conducted for every single parcel. Um, and um, Isaac Robb, who's our uh, Vice President of Planning and Development, um, is leading this work, and he'll go into great detail around this. Um, 
The results of this project will provide important data to the city that will assist in identifying, prioritizing for rehabilitation, uh, lead abatement, code violations, demolition, and other pressing needs. In 2015, the Land Conservancy did a citywide property inventory. And then in 2018, uh, at the request of the St. Luke's Foundation and the City of Cleveland, we did a more concentrated, focused area in the, uh, the southeast side of Cleveland, uh, focusing in on the Broadway Slavic Village, Buckeye Shaker Square, Buckeye Woodland, uh, Collin Collinwood, Nottingham, Fairfax, Glenville, Huff, Kinsman, Lee Harvard, Lisaville, Mount Pleasant, St. Clair Superior, and Union Miles. So we have data from 2015 citywide, 2018 in those targeted neighborhoods, and now we're gonna have another layer of data that'll be complete in 2023 for uh, the citywide. Um, and uh, the other um, initiative that we're working on citywide uh, in 2021, we found out that we were the successful applicant for uh, United uh, US EPA Environmental Justice Cumulative, uh, cumulative Problem Solving Grant that really challenged nonprofits to work with local government and tackle a perplexing policy issue that is holding government back. And so we obviously chose vacant land. You know, we have 30,000 vacant lands, uh, lots in the city of Cleveland, uh, nearly 20,000 of them are owned by uh, the city of Cleveland. I wanna acknowledge uh, the tremendous leadership from Director Hernandez. Um, you know, it's challenging for her department. They take in about 600 vacant lots oh, yeah. a year, and they put out about 400 uh, per year. So I don't know, D Director Hernandez, anything you want to say, or should we just go into our presentation? Happy to support, happy to answer any questions. I, I made the joke. I said, oh, is it, is it hard for her? <laughs> <laughs> it's always easy. It's a breeze. Hold. <laughs> so, Mr. Chair, if it's okay with you, um, Absolutely. what I'd like to do is just quickly go through the presentation. And if you look, sure. you know, the Western Reserve Land Currents, uh, conservancy, we operate kind of in three spaces. The space, the photo on the left, uh, you pe see people walking on the trails. That's uh, kind of how we were funded, founded as an organization, doing a lot of um, conservation work in ex-urban, more rural communities. Um, and then in the middle area, we started, we recognized, you know, uh, the economic uh, power of, of, of the state uh, is heavily based in agriculture. So but, uh, we started getting heavily involved in preserving uh, agricultural land to prevent more urban sprawl, right? People want to go out and build in, in green fields. And so we're conserving a lot of land in that regard. And then on the right, that's, this is our Thriving Communities program. Um, the, the team that I lead, and it focuses on urban centers throughout Northeast Ohio. Our footprint is in 29 counties. I'll tell you, the Thriving Communities team in front of you, probably 98% of our work is in the city of Cleveland, but we primarily operate in Cuyahoga County. And we're always here willing to support uh, the council. Um, we've enjoyed a, a, a working relationship with this council for nearly a decade, and if there's any uh, policy work or it, things that you want us to look and examine, uh, consult on to see how you can advance development in your ward, please reach out to me uh, directly and uh, we'll get the right resources together. And, you know, central to our mission, we want to provide the people of our region with the central national natural assets through land conservation and restoration. This uh, program, the Thriving Communities Program, has been laser focused on the removal of vacant and dilapidated homes under the former leadership of Jim Rakakis, my predecessor, uh, planting trees, creating parks, and new green spaces in urban neighborhoods. We were uh, directly responsible for the creation of the statewide Ohio Land Bank Association. I think there's now over 65 counties of the 88 in Ohio that have land bank programs. Uh, we also were the lead agency in advocating for demo dollars uh, to the tune of a little over $900 million flowed back into Ohio from federal resources, but we also lobbied state, county leadership, and city leadership, and all of you have done an amazing job. Uh, we've removed a lot of blighted land, so now we have land, and so now let's put it back into to productive use. So at this time, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Isaac Robb, who's gonna talk about the property inventory work, Isaac. Through the chair to the committee, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us. As mentioned, you we will be, oh. So you have to lean so far. Thank you, appreciate it. That's better. 
We will be talking about these two initiatives today, and I will be focusing primarily on the property inventory with my colleague, Adrian Marty, to give you a bit of a flavor for the day-to-day -day interactions that the property surveyors have had with residents of the city. And then our colleagues at the end will talk about the vacant land initiative. Hey, Isaac, could you just yes. hold one second through the chair to uh, the, the council members? One thing that I did want all of you to be aware of, um, this prop citywide property, it's not being funded by the city of Cleveland. Uh, Director Martin was an amazing partner and was able to get um, Rocket Mortgage uh, uh, Philanthropy to uh, help fund this along with LISC and along with the Cleveland Foundation. Yeah. So this is a budget neutral proposition, but it's going to be a powerful resource uh, that will benefit this council for many years. Count, um, Isaac. So as mentioned, every parcel in the city of Cleveland is being inventoried. So 167,287 parcels will have data and photos associated with it. What's really exciting, as Matt mentioned previously, there are more questions being answered than ever before. This was done in collaboration with multiple departments from the city administration, led by Director Martin in Building and Housing, as well as Director DeRosa at MOCAP and Director Hernandez in Community Development. So there are a total of 52 questions potentially being answered, and they are answered in a decision tree method. So each surveyor doesn't have to answer questions on a vacant lot that might pertain to a roof condition or a window. So people are able to move through these questions in a very efficient manner. Every surveyor was assigned a tablet that had a data plan associated with it, and we're working in teams of two. Primarily questions related to housing. Um, Karen Detmer was really instrumental in getting a lot of questions related to lead and peeling paint. But we had answered questions on fire hydrant, sidewalk condition, what the curb was made out of, the condition of the curb, the height of the curb, the street tree condition, is there illegal dumping, are there parked cars, a real litany of questions that I think we'll be able to provide a very robust uh, set of data that will be able to be shared not only with the administration but other nonprofit partners throughout our city. So why do these surveys matter? Here are some examples that Matt mentioned uh, that we collected from the 2015 and then 2018. We know these, this data that we're being um, tasked with collecting is a snapshot in time. Things can happen very quickly. Someone moves out, um, a house is demolished, land is left to sort of go fallow and things grow quickly. So really we want to track changes over time. And to our knowledge, we, as in the city of Cleveland, are the only city of our size in the country to have this comprehensive data being collected in three specific data points and stored digitally in a publicly accessible way, which is something that I think we all should be very proud of. But we recognize that while this data uh, keeps us more informed, it doesn't necessarily make us smarter. It's how we use and deploy these resources that we will really be tested and held accountable to. So again, in 2018, some of the things that we were able to determine, though, is where are things concentrated? Where are vacancies in distressed properties concentrated? Where, are, where is illegal dumping concentrated? And how can we best deploy our scarce resources? And that is something that Director Martin has been very clear to our team, is that this will allow the Building and Housing Department to really take a more proactive approach to code enforcement that maybe we haven't had in the past, which is very exciting. Again, this is something that we are very expert in. We have done close to two dozen property inventories throughout the state. Most notably in 2021, we were down in the city of Hamilton, which is in Butler County in the southwestern part of our state. The city of Hamilton is equivalent to the size of Lorraine, around 30,000 parcels. Uh, just to give people a little bit of context to really underscore how big of a project this was, the entire city of Hamilton is about equivalent to the size of Old Brooklyn. I mean, the city of Cleveland is just doing something, a large metro area in its entirety is really an undertaking. And I commend the building and housing staff, the staff of MOCAP, and the staff of community development, as well as our HHI partners on being able to, to really undertake this all at once. On when we were fully staffed, we would have 25 people out a day. And Adrian will talk a little bit more on what that looked like. But again, it's a lot of coordinating. It's making sure people are, are working efficiently and safely throughout our various neighborhoods. 
real quick, I want to go over how this data will be used. Um, I know recently council committed significant funding to our partners at Neo Candu and NST at Case Western Reserve. This is very exciting news. For those of you that don't use this on a daily or weekly basis, it's an incredible tool that our region has. And this data, once we go through our quality control process, will be immediately shared with the city of Cleveland and then also with our partners at Neo Candu and Case. Again, we really think that this can help inform strategies on scarce rehab dollars. Um, we'll sort of go through a little bit of an overview on how the tool can be used, but peeling paint, where we should be planting more trees, where illegal dumping occurs, things of that nature. And then hopefully for each of you, you'll be able to really hone in on trends happening within your wards over time. This is something that you know we would be more than happy to help you do a comparative analysis from the 2015 potentially if your neighborhood or your ward was covered in 2018, and then ultimately what things look like in 2022 and 2023. As Director Martin mentioned, there's a high level of professionalism through this data collection that we maybe haven't had in the past, so we're really happy to be able to stand by this data and its integrity once we roll it out after our quality control process. I'm now gonna hand it over to my colleague, Adrian Marty, and I'm gonna pull up actually the tool and give a little bit of a tutorial on how this data can be used in real time. Adrian, do you wanna talk about our daily efforts? Great, thank you. Uh, through our chair to the members of council, um, as Isaac and Director Martin said, just incredible people at the city. So it was taking these truly experts at building and housing and these inspectors that had decades of experience and then building pairs um, in terms of safety and um, uh, you know um, being able to talk to each other and discuss properties together on site um, and so every week we would work together and uh, discuss certain things that would come up um, maybe technological issues um, questions about uh, what these uh, variables may mean on site and so um, after a few weeks, uh, it was incredible. Consistency started to happen. Uh, like we said uh, earlier, the winter was wonderful. Uh, January and February, I mean, it was actually incredibly cold some days. And the teams were there still at 7.30 in the morning, taking in that information. So um, yeah, it was incredible working with them. And uh, just the integrity of the data is gonna be incredible where this, this um, decades of experience will be there uh, in this data collection. Thank you very much, Adrian. So as folks can see here, we are able from our office to t take in data in real time. So this was timestamped for 9.53 this morning. So surveyors are out there um, collecting data. Just to give everyone a bit of an overview here, everything in this sort of pink, um, purple is data that has already been collected and everything in green is data that we still need to, to collect. So as you can see, out of those 167,000 parcels, we are um, about 97% of the way done. Obviously the last little bit, um, the parcels maybe were duplicated or are missing in sort of very discrete areas, so it does take a little bit more time for the final cleanup but as you can see here, we have over 161,000 uh, parcels posted too. What also has been very helpful with this tool is you can track productivity on a daily basis in real time. So Adrian can be working with um, Tim and Eric from Building and Housing. So this shows on, I believe, Thursday of last week, we were able to post 1,100 uh, records with 17 surveyors out in the field and this is sort of showing the trend when we started in October um, over time so this is something that we really were following up having those weekly meetings with director Martin and her staff to make sure everyone was out on time working safely and working hard to hit our goal the weather was a big benefit to us we were sort of right on target but as you can see here um, around December we were a little concerned but really made up for it in January and February which we weren't necessarily expecting then in conclusion I want to show just really quickly how this can be used in real time so for example you might be interested in your ward of selecting um, residential parcels that are occupied and we'll say residential that received, um, let's say, a grade of C. C grades are sort of those 
average condition, so this might be something where code enforcement or reinvestment could be most useful. So we'll select letter C, see how good the internet in this room is. <laughs> So you can do things, and as you can see, it's starting to populate. Um, you can then do these different sort of filters. So you could look for vacant lots that had dumping. You could look at commercial properties that are vacant. So you can see here, out of those 167,000 parcels, 37,000 are residential, occupied, and receiving a C grade. You can then combine with that data in NST to see if it's owned by an LLC, if it's on the rental registry, or if it's owner-occupied, things like that, to really hone in on where you think resources are best, um, best needed. So then you can zoom in, and then everything that is highlighted would be this residential occupied C property. You can pull it up, see you know, the sidewalk, photos of the, photo, photos of the structure, and then also a list so we know who the surveyor was, what time this data was collected, and then all of the questions are right there. You could then export this data into an Excel file, into a GIS file to you know, be shared, and you can map specific things, conditions over time. Again, what's really exciting about having the 2015 and 2018 data is that you can map hotspots. You can look, was this a property an A or a B in 2015? Is it a C, or was it maybe a C um, today, but maybe a D or an F previously? So you can join permits that were pulled, things of that nature, to really get um, and slice and dice this data in any way that you would like. So with that, I will conclude my presentation. Matt, I don't know if you'd like to have questions on this before we go to the next. Go, go to the presentation. And through the ch or to the chair, to uh, members of council, once all the data is collected and it's uploaded to NST, we'll, let, we'll work with uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Joe Titran, your policy person here. So you'll be able then to customize the data for each ward, and, and so we'll make sure that you have um, those resources as well. Isaac, um, can you go to the presentation? Click on it. Yes. I think that's it, right? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you want to entertain questions on the property inventory first? Yes. Before we go? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> first and foremost, thank you, uh, Isaac. Thank you, uh, uh, Adrian. Uh, uh, Councilman Zone, uh, Director Martin, Director Hernandez in the back. I know there was other departments, and I don't want to forget anybody. They feel free to, to let us know who they are. Thank you for your diligence. This is, you know, just looking at this information you presented today, and not having the full scale uh, yet as you all are continuing the process. I'm, I'm excited, right? You know, when we get those calls about these problem properties, you know, or, you know, I'm calling up a longtime staffer of a CDC in the ward to say, hey, do you remember what this property looked like years ago? Can you, because I'm drawing a blank here, or was something here before? This really helps fill those voids, mm -hmm. right, that exist. Uh, information that is greatly needed. So when we are looking at uh, policy and, and what policy we create and how much do we fund, where do we fund, where do we support uh, the city uh, in, in what capacity, this is very helpful, in my opinion, very, very helpful. Now, the one thing that I am most interested in is once this information is completed, mm -hmm. the intersections between this and NST, yeah. been able to figure out uh, who are the LLCs, you know, whether they are are in, 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 in state owners, out of state owners, uh, homeowners, uh, uh, rental properties, whatever the case is. And you mentioned that that information will also tell us if there's a rental registration uh, on the property as well, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Okay. That's Good. correct. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my, my, my colleague on to, to my right, you know, who um, who is consistently, well, both of them rather, you know, uh, on top of this this issue here. I got one colleague who is not here in the northeast side with me. You know, that is one thing that he drills down on time. every single time about those <laughs> LLCs and those properties, and particularly the problem ones, right? Yeah. Because not all LLCs are bad because there are some good uh, folks who take care of these properties who have done some amazing things, but, you know, uh, the, the, the bad actors who, is who have has overshadowed those who are doing the good work. Uh, but thank you for the information. I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Uh, I'll start on the end, Councilman uh, Harsh. 
Thank you. I just have a couple quick questions through the chair, um, and you know, I will echo the sentiment. This is absolutely fantastic. I wish that um, I wish I had the the the, the visual memory of, of Judge Pianca that I could just close my eyes and see every single house in the city the way it existed five years ago, ten years ago, and right now. I, I wish I had that, but since I don't have that photographic memory, um, this is the next best thing. And I would I would also say that this is a great baseline for us because in five years when these photos are still there, we'll be able to call out a slumlord and say, no, you didn't fix your property because I got a picture of it five years ago. That's it right. looks even, you know, <clears throat> it looks, it looks uh, better than it does now. So we'll be able to use this as a baseline for a long, long time. My question through the chair to whoever wants to, to, to handle it um, is uh, when this information is um, shared with NST, mm -hmm. um, would that be the public's primary or sole portal into this? Because it seems like some of this is going to be pri uh, proprietary for good reasons, um, and some of this is going to be made available to the public. So can we talk about that interaction between what's available to the public and um, uh, what's proprietary? Sure. Uh, through the chair to Councilman Harsh and, and Isaac, you might want to add on to this. Um, what we will offer this council too is once uh, all the quality control is, is finished, the data work is done, if you wanted to do a work session, Mr. Chairman, sure. and you hosted here at the council, I can bring my team in here and we can walk through um, the screen, uh, help you familiarize it. But yes, we have every intention of uploading this to NST. So Isaac, why don't you talk a little bit about that as well? Through the chair to the council member. The data in initially will be shared to the departments within the city administration as well as NST. As far as other ways that the public can access it, we are planning on creating some more stagnant maps in a story map form, which will be a website that shows maybe areas where demolition permits have been pulled or vacant lots, where vacant and abandoned DNF structures are. Mm -hmm. But that will not be interactive in the way that they could zoom in, click on it, and then pull up a specific parcel information. It would be more of a overall trend, and that would be posted online that the public could access. But the actual parcel level data, the NST platform will be the primary way okay. that people access that. Okay, that's great. It's really important through the chair too as well um, because we need to be able to have academics get at this data so that they can sort of figure out the larger trends that are happening within our communities. Uh, I think all of us on, in, in council know our neighborhoods really well. I, I've got 9,000 houses though and I can't always keep that visual of them, but, but we might not know each other's neighborhoods as well. So being able to look at all of our communities together at, on the same application to figure out where the most uh, distribution of, of uh, A, B, C, D, F houses are is going to help all of us and, and certainly Director Martin she directs you know, important scarce resources to the, to the most needed areas. So I think this is a fantastic project. I'm glad we're wrapped up. Um, and I, I can't wait to be able to spend a couple hours diving into this. And thank you all for your work. Absolutely. Councilwoman. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. It's great to be here with everyone. For, for any of you who don't know, a uh, fun fact about me, um, Matt Zone was my predecessor on Cleveland <laughs> City Council. So I um, hold the seat that Councilman Zone, former Councilman Zone, held for 19 years, which is very awesome. So um, it's great to be with you all today. And I, I'm really following, for, uh, first, Mr. Chair, my first question is really a follow-up to what Councilman Harsh was, was uh, kind of intuiting about the interface between Regrid and NST. And I have, I, I will confess to you all, it's embarrassed to uh, confess this in a public setting, but I gotta do it. I haven't been on NST for, for a little while, right? And, and if you're not a frequent user, it's not necessarily, it's my recollection that it's not quite as intuitive. So um, I, I think this is perhaps a comment more than a question, but just about um, how to get council staff um, kind of skilled up with NST or and or any other users because this is so this makes me feel like oh I could do this I can I can figure this out I could zoom in and you know that's just very intuitive um, but I'm not it's not my recollection that NST is quite as intuitive so curious about how um, the, on the user interface side how to skill people up uh, through the chair to the councilwoman I, I agree with that the NST I know historically NST was running a series of trainings on that um, for the council. However, I think we'd be more than happy to work with our partners, Mike Schramm at the Cuyahoga Land Bank and others mm -hmm. to come in and do a real sort of quick but deep dive on how to access this data specifically and how to do those joins of data 
that we were talking about with LLCs, rental registration, and this property inventory data. And if I can, Councilwoman, so uh, I am working with the land bank to put together a day for members of council uh, or this committee to go over to land bank offices to uh, do a, uh, well, they'll pre put together a presentation with us and also go through how you can uh, research and look for data with Mike and his team there. Uh, so we are working to put something like that together. If I, if I could, Mr. Chairman, so um, uh, I don't know if you know this even, Mr. Chair, our office is right next to the county land. Thanks, sir. And so um, uh, if you just work with them, let us know, and we can. I, I'll make sure I have some staff sure. available there who can walk through this That's data great. set as okay. well. Thank you. Great. I'll look forward to that. Thank you very much, everybody. And then I... Um, one more question, and then I'll, I'll just conclude with a comment. But uh, if we can go back a couple slides, there was the one with the city, uh, this one, city of Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I was just curious through the chair, I think maybe to Isaac, what is that, what does hot and cold spots mean? Will we have a similar data uh, or mapping for Cleveland? What does that really mean? How are we supposed to interpret hot and cold spot? Through the chair to the councilwoman. You're absolutely right. This is an example of kind of the final stagnant map that I was discussing. Again, the city of Hamilton is relatively small compared to the city of Cleveland. But with this hot and cold map, so the map to the right shows all of the different categories. So the light blue being occupied structures, red being vacant structures, yellow being vacant lots. And on the map to the left, that is a hot spot. So through our GIS, our geographic information system, data analysis, you can do a cluster analysis to show if a vacant lot is within a certain proximity to another vacant lot, mm -hmm. and that creates a hot spot on where vacant lots are most mostly found within the city. So you'll be able to go to really granular granular detail on vacant land, vacant uh, vacant buildings, or whatever specific types of interactions that you would like to see. We did um, a project with the Cuyahoga Solid Waste District on illegal dumping that we were working with the Department of Public Works on, and we were really targeting where illegal dumping hotspots were on vacant lots in the southeast side last year. So we can do that analysis rel relatively easily for members of council. Great, thank you. And then just to, to chime in on what others have already said, I think all of us could not be more grateful for the good weather <laughs> we have this winter. I think we could have still been in the thick of this process, right, because it was so susceptible to, to weather and the ability, the visibility, right? You have to really be able to see a structure to assess it. And so um, we all were totally on board with the need to have full capacity behind this to get it done. But through the chair to Director Martin, so excited to soon with we're at 97 percent soon to be back um to regular business of the city as well um not a moment too soon yes but this we were all totally in sync about the need for this survey and um the need to have uh city staffing resources behind it so thank you all very much thank you councilwoman councilwoman santana Good morning, everyone, um, through the chair. Uh, congratulations, uh, Director uh, Martin. What happened? We're good? Oh, you're good? Oh, I'm good, okay. This is huge. I remember when I was first elected and I was just so overwhelmed with the flight, with the blight, and then Councilman um, Zone said, take, you know, drive up and down the streets, do the inventory, what Councilman Harsh right now, and it was just overwhelming, right? Because you don't know what to look at and, and what structures. Um, to jot down. So this is amazing. Congratulations. So a couple questions. I know um, Councilman Harsh asked a question, but um, through the chair to anyone who wants to answer, will LLCs have access to this data? Through the chair to the councilwoman, no. To my, again, we do not work for NST, but our understanding is the only people that are granted access have a .gov, a .edu, or a .org. Now that's not to say that you know there aren't ways to get around that, but I would say historically, NST has been very vigilant on who they allow access to Got of it. the data. Um, brings me to the next question through the chair. Considering that Rocket Mortgage is a funder and a sponsor, will they have access to this data? Director, <clears throat> through the chair to the councilwoman. Um, we certainly are going to do a presentation to our funders and show them all the data that we've collected. Um, Rocket Community Foundation 
is a philanthropy and mm-hmm. isn't really Rocket Mortgage. Got so it. it's a, spe- a separate entity. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Um, my worry is that they have been um, approved many mortgages in my ward and now that they have you know maybe they'll see access and see the blight i'm curious to know if this will impact future um mortgage approval and then um and then last but not least so let's just say through the chair i export all my f properties right that are owned by the llc will i be able to send that through building and housing for siding or is that too overwhelming for um, building and housing? Through the chair to the councilwoman, we are taking that data and reacting to all of the low value properties, the F properties, the Ds and the Cs. So the idea is that for the most part, Fs are gonna need to come down, so we need to start prioritizing those for demo. So without your having to do anything, we have the data, we're gonna act on it, um, and then start targeting resources to the C and D properties to see you know, if we can help um, get enough, you know, grant money, loan money to help them get their houses fixed. So we want to be proactive in our use of this data. Perfect. Thank you, Director. And that was my next question. Now that we've approved so many housing, you know, um, ARPA dollars, now maybe we can yeah. let um, our residents know about these resources available. Absolutely. Thank you. Congratulations. This is great. And I look forward to the training. Thank you. Um, one point you mentioned, uh, Director Martin, you asked a question about um, for the F properties and looking to prioritize or come down. You know, the county is acting as our agent to take down almost what, 300 plus uh, nuisance properties for us. Mm-hmm. Does this, will this information reflect any uh, F property that is in the pipeline to come down that's been sent over and approved by the, the city for the land bank to take down? To the chair, yes. Um, we're aware of what's in our demo pipeline now. Many of those Fs already are. so. You know, it'll help reorient us to making sure we have the entire universe gotcha. in the pipeline to be demolished if we can't save it. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Joe Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to first uh, start out by uh, thanking um, the Western Re- uh, Reserve Land Conservancy, Matt Zone, and his team uh, for doing a wonderful job with working with the city to put all of this together. And I know that over the years, um, the city of Cleveland has been consistently from one department or from one administration to the next administration uh, collecting data. Uh, I can recall going all the way back, there's always been uh, how do we um, uh, strengthen our housing stock? How do we keep the city of Cleveland stable? How do we make sure that we're whole, not just in some areas, but overall? And that used to be the theme a long time ago in the city of Cleveland. Matt probably will recall this coming into council at that time. Uh, the theme was neighborhoods first. And that was important because we knew that in order to keep the city of Cleveland strong, we have to keep the neighborhood strong. In order to do that, we need to know where those spots and those locations were that we needed to focus and target in on economic development. And so that leads me to this question, Mr. Chairman, and I think my colleague Jasmine Santana kind of touched a little bit on it, on the funders of the grant. Just want to understand that that little nuance there for a quick moment. Um, the sponsors of the grant, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Cleveland Foundation and Rocket Mortgage. There was a third person, and who was that? Um, through the chair to Councilman Jones, that was LISC. That's uh, the acronym. Is it L-I-S-T? L-I-S-C. LISC, Local Initiatives Support Corporation. There you go. I always forget the I. Yeah, and they're uh, through the chair to Councilman Jones. They're also um, uh, a funder of uh, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress as well. Oh, they're a funder of Cleveland? Mm -hmm. Okay. And LISC is not just City of Cleveland. LISC is is national. is a national organization. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm writing it down. Please forgive me. Um, the, with funding this, uh, Mass, how much was the grant for? So through the chair to Councilman Jones, uh, it was a total of uh, $170,000. Uh, Racket Community Foundation um, uh, was able to award a $100,000 uh, grant towards this work. 
um, Lisk was a fifty thousand, and the Cleveland Foundation was twenty thousand. Okay. And then, Mr. Chairman, um, to the department, when because this is a lot of information to pull together and and make mm -hmm. it happen. Um, how much time did we spend helping to gather that, and what that preliminary or potential cost could be? Do we know? Through the chair to Councilman Jones, we started doing orientation in the middle of October. The troops really hit the ground like the third week in October. So it's really been November, December, November uh, 4 to today. I see. So, and that's your group? No, uh, through the chair to um, Councilman Jones. You know, in 2015 when we did this, um, this work, uh, this cost over a half a million dollars. Okay, now we Because we had to hire temporary employees. And um, what we were experiencing is the quality control of the data wasn't as good. And this time we used, as, as Isaac said, and Isaac, why don't you speak a little bit to uh, the workforce? Yeah, so through the chair to the councilman, this year the team members were primarily from the Department of Building and Housing, but also some inspectors from MOCAP, community development, as well as, after the first of the year, some of the healthy home inspectors through our CDC partners. So that really allowed us to have a higher level of professionalism, and that's where the majority of the staff time came in. Right. You know, looking at this, and because you, you've had to put some money into it, I'm quite sure. And, um, and I know that we're not funding any of this through ARPA. How do we maintain um, moving forward? Because properties are lucid and they constantly change. How do we move from, you know, year to year with this mm -hmm. and what that cost will look like? Uh, through the chair to uh, the members of council, um, this is like strategic planning. Mm -hmm. Every good organization, um, whether you're an organization or um, a nonprofit who wants to do land use planning, you really should do this type of work every three to five years. The data is only good as the data. And as Isaac showed you, you even saw those photos from 2015 to 2018, how that one structure changed. And then there was another structure that was no longer there. One of the things that I did when I was on council in 2015, once we had the data, I met every other month with the section chief of building and housing who was responsible for our ward. And we looked at every D and F property over a 60 day period to see kind of what progress was being made. Then the CDC focused on the C and B properties with um, communication about various programs and assistance that they could offer people to improve their homes. So it's really, uh, it's gonna need skillful coordination in terms of maintaining this data, Councilman Jones, moving forward, on incumbent upon the local development corporation, working with the council member, working with the city, the, the appropriate department in the city to make sure you can see improvements in your community. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, looking at what the conservancy is doing, you stated earlier in your testimony, uh, Mr. Zone, that there was a number of neighborhoods um, from 2018, mm -hmm. and uh, I won't name them all, but you know, of course, I'm. Uh, Lee Harvard bit. was one of them. You know it. <laughs> so Lee Harvard, Seville, um, Mount Pleasant, Union Miles uh, area is my concern. Yeah. So my question would be, uh, did we do a current survey or is this, were we still working with the old data uh, that was developed in 2018? So through the chair to Councilman Jones, um, this is a totally new data. What we can do for you, we can give you data sets and show you in, in a, snap, a snapshot what properties look like in Lee Harvard in 2015, in 2018, in 2023, and we can provide that. I, I would I would love that, and I certainly want to take you up on your, um, you know, and I know we've had conversations in the past, but we never was able to connect yet um, about economic development because mm -hmm. none of this data collection means anything if we're not doing something with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Chairman. I would like to see out of this data information that's being collected, because I've sat here long enough at this table to see a lot of it done, but I haven't seen it utilized in a way where it can make our city strong and whole. So my question would be, um, I know that uh, for building and housing, we'll know exactly where to go and send our inspectors, and then we should be able to have a template or a system in place um, where we can start really making a dent on these. Um, and, and I would ask you to comment, Mr. Chairman, to Mrs. Martin before, after Matt's on, because I have to go straight here with economic development. 
So with economic development, can you give us an example, Mr. Mr. Chairman to Mr. Zone, um, how this would impact, say, a Lee Harvard area, um, and how we can use this data to, to be creative mm -hmm. with one, and then two, uh, is there an arm to this system that we put together to really go after contractors and bring in new housing developers if we're going to get serious about improving the condition of the city of Cleveland? We can't just put the data together, but we need to go get the people and bring them into the market space. Uh, through the chair to uh, Councilman Jones, and, and, and I think you'll see even by the next presentation what we're doing around vacant land will, will feed into that economic development strategy. But ultimately, you know, enforcement resides within the city of Cleveland. And what you can do, because we're also inspecting commercial corridors, uh, industrial properties as well, is work with the appropriate departments inside of City Hall and your local CDCs on uh, economic redevelopment strategies on how you can improve those commercial corridors. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would make myself available just to be a, an advisor, uh, to have members of council run concepts off of me and, and what I can do to help support you know, Absolutely. members um, uh, as they go to turn properties around. Councilman Jones, did I answer your question? I hope I did. Somewhat, but we'll, you know, <laughs> hey, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna beat you up at the table because okay. you're on that side. <laughs> now, if you was on this side of the table, you're the chairman. I'll be beating you up all day. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I just, days. you know, we'll, we'll sit down and talk about how we can put that together. And then next, how do we take the data from the city perspective and really start making a dent, mm -hmm. dent in it? Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Director, do you want to? Through the chair to the councilman, um, it's it's our highest priority to act on the data. And we have a once in a generation opportunity with ARPA to also target assistance funds to some of those homeowners who in the past may have been cited but couldn't afford to make repairs. Now, do we see, Mr. Chairman, to Mrs. Martin, a lot of that? Or do, or do, or do we have a situation where, I know we have it uh, with homeowners who, who actually reside in the city of Cleveland. Uh, do we see a lot of that with, because I see a lot of uh, uh, people who have LLCs that are renting properties. You know, at one point in time, our neighborhood uh, prided itself on 80% uh, home ownership. Uh, we can't, we don't hold that title anymore. Uh, we're looking at 40% home ownership and 60% rental, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. to Mrs. Martin, so Mr. Director Martin. Um, so. How are we holding accountable these these LLCs who are purchasing our properties and not maintaining them? Through the chair to the councilman, um, we're putting more tools in the toolbox. So you'll see us coming before you very shortly with some legislative changes. I saw some of that. I like it. Yeah. Um, so so with that, uh, and I wanted that's the reason why I asked you the question. So if you want to <laughs> kind of like sweeten the pot here and talk a little bit about it. <laughs> So, so, so if you don't, that's okay. So, so Mr. Chairman, uh, to the group that's here, I um, really appreciate the work that you do. I have no further questions. Thank you, Councilman. Um, as I've said earlier, and as uh, uh, Councilman Zone uh, offered, we will uh, put together a work session once the quality control uh, has been completed, uh, NST has been uh, intersect with this. We'll bring them back. We'll take one of our committee meetings. We'll have a, a, a very uh, a robust interaction uh, around this information. We'll bring city departments down as well uh, for us to all in, engage on this information. You know, my hope is once we get all of the data back and put together, that we'll work with uh, whatever city departments to begin to, to target those resources that we have put forth uh, through ARPA and just our, our, our everyday uh, resources that we provide for residents of the city of Cleveland. All right, Council, turn it back over for the next Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the next presentation is on the US EPA funded Cleveland Initiative. Cleveland is an acronym, and an acronym stands for Cleveland Vacant Land Opportunity Tool. And what Cleveland attempts to do is build upon previous and ongoing investments in vacant land planning to create a collaboratively built, transparent, and accessible planning tool to accelerate vacant land reuse and advance environmental justice. As this council knows, there are over 30,000 vacant lots in the city of Cleveland, and roughly 20,000 of those are owned by the city of Cleveland Land Bank. Um, the 
Currently, these parcels represent a burden on city resources and pose health and safety threats to residents. As I said in my opening comments, the city's department has taken in roughly 600 land bank vacant lots a year, but they're only putting out about 400. So there's a net gain. And so I want to just acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of Director Hernandez, uh, AD uh, Wackers, um, and the whole team who's been very involved in this initiative. Um, uh, the US EPA grant that we were seeking and that we went and were, uh, it was a very competitive process. There were only, I think, 45 awards throughout the entire country, and we were one group that received it, but it wanted um, organizations to work with local government and uh, tackle a perplexing uh, policy matter that is really holding government back. So we chose vacant land in the city of Cleveland, and with this, I'd like to turn it over to our, our colleague, Tim Dean, who's going to walk you through the presentation. Tim. Thanks, Matt. And to the, uh, through the chair, to the members of council, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, to listen to Cleveland today. Um, it's kind of hard. So, Tim, can you get a little closer? closer. Yeah. Okay. Good? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the project vision for Cleveland, as Matt said, is to build a collaboratively built, transparent, and accessible planning tool to accelerate vacant land reuse and advance environmental justice. So we see this taking two types of forms of development in Cleveland. Um, typically, when we think about development, we think about building and housing. But uh, as the Land Conservancy and other organizations that work to uh, green uh, vacant lots, we also see green development happening. And so Cleveland is a way to accelerate both of these kinds of development. Uh, as Matt said, this is a collaborative problem-solving process. So there's many, many project partners, and it's not solely the work of the Land Conservancy. I should also mention um, we have a project consultant, Seventh Hill Design, and David Jerka. He's done a tremendous amount of work to help organize this project and um, create a lot of the beautiful graphics that you see. So uh, with the project partners, we've, we have a core, core group of partners, including the City of Cleveland's administration and Cleveland City Council, as well as um, nonprofits. Uh, who also operate in this space. And um, through our stakeholder sessions, we've gathered over 30 different organizations, in initiatives, and individuals through the process. Um, most notably, I should mention uh, the Case Western Reserve University's Environmental Law Clinic, um, who has been doing interviews of both the the city administration, as well as council members and many folks in this room today um, to learn about their experience with the land bank and ways that uh, we could work to improve it. Thank, and Tim, just if I could, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, the members of council. All of you have been very gracious with your time, who's agreed to uh, interview them. I know we have a second round of interviews going, but it's really important that they have your perspective, Councilman House. Um, and Councilman Griffin actually gave some really good perspective on, on what they'd like to see in your ward. And so that's the information that we're looking to capture as well. Tim? Thanks. So for the grant's purpose, we chose the target neighborhoods uh, that are served by our CDC partners, BBC and Union Miles. Um, this section of Cleveland uh, has over about 25% of the Cleveland Land Bank inventory, so about 4,500 parcels out of the 18,000. Um, and, and just for the purposes of this grant, we're focusing on kind of resident outreach for focus groups and things like that in these neighborhoods. But we expect that the outcomes and the deliverables of Cleveland can be used across the city to improve vacant lots anywhere. The project timeline, it's a two-year timeline, and right now um, we're about a quarter of the way through the second year. So far, we've had a few stakeholder summits where we formed working groups and developed problem statements um, to address kind of the key challenges with vacant land reuse today. And then we formed these working groups that were co-chaired um, by uh, members of our, our partner projects, uh, our partner projects. And uh, now we're kind of working on this phase of developing the vacant land planning tool. And, and I'll describe a little bit more about like, what that actually means in the next few slides. So we had four working groups. They were each co chaired by somebody from one of our nonprofit partners, as well as a high ranking member of the city administration, including AD Wackers. Um, and they focused on these four key challenges long term stewardship and support of projects, planning criteria, metrics, and integration, process transparency and community engagement, and policy and funding. So um, each of the groups developed a problem statement, developed a proposed solution, and then developed a prototype solution to that 
problem. So we had each group make something that would help uh, solve that problem or illustrate a solution to that problem. It wasn't a, a perfect solution, but it was sort of a piece of the puzzle. This is a little bit about what Cleveland looks like. Um, so we have uh, a kickoff meeting that was attended by all of our project partners, um, including Council President Griffin. In uh, December, we had a resident focus group with about 13 residents from the, um, the southeast neighborhoods where they gave us feedback on the prototypes that the working groups then used to kind of further refine their efforts. We had uh, working group summits, um, one in BBC's service area, one in Union Miles' service area, and one here in City Hall where we brainstormed uh, solutions to some of the problems the working groups were working on. Um, and that last photo in the bottom right is from the working group summit in uh, Union Miles where we mapped out what are people's experiences with vacant land reuse. So we kind of created these user experience journeys um, that we're kind of using as a baseline for identifying challenges and, and things like that. So um, from the working groups, the, the sort of tool, if you want to say, is actually composed of five different pieces of this puzzle. And the goal for Cleveland this year is to further refine and develop each of these pieces in collaboration so that they fit together. So you could develop one of these pieces on its own, but it might not fit well, real well with the other pieces and therefore would kind of leave um, some weird gaps. So Cleveland probably isn't going to solve every single problem with vacant land reuse in Cleveland, but with these five pieces, I think we're going to do a pretty good job at making it better than it was. So those five pieces are a vacant lot reuse priority map that will help you identify those lots for gray development or those lots for green development, um, a user-friendly application process, a digital resource center, and a physical resource center. And both of these resource centers can be used by residents as well as um, folks like librarians who could help uh, who residents kind of seek information from or maybe executive assistance to council members who need help kind of orienting folks who call their office about how to reuse a vacant lot or get a side yard or something like that. And then we're working with BBC and Union Miles to develop demonstration projects that will um, further enrich those user experience journeys and make sure that the uh, changes we're making to the process are actually flowing out into projects that are happening in the real world. If you have more information, we keep... Tim, could you go back to that slide, please? Sure. So let me give an example through the chair to the members of council. Um, the light blue section, vacant lot reuse priority map. Right now, we're working with the community development department and the planning department, and we're going to overlay over... We're working with them so we can know and identify where are those 15-minute neighborhoods that the city is working on. Where are those, um, where are the vacant lots in high pressure neighborhoods that maybe are coded differently so now you can drive affordable housing to those uh, infill opportunities? Where are there vacant lots in emerging neighborhoods where you want advanced market rate housing? Those could be coded a different way. So it's really gonna be a more strategic approach on how you dispose of land. In the past, as you know, um, much of it was done, we were following the lead of the local CDC or what the planner said. This is now going to allow council to, to be very proactive in developing strategies that really build out and, and create um, quality neighborhoods um, using this data moving forward. Tim. Thanks. Councilman. Um, does that also, I didn't ask that question, does this also include um, um, commercial businesses too and property? So this, uh, so this work right here is more looking at, um, this initiative is looking at a, 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 a problem that's challenging for the city. We focus this one on vacant land. What about the property survey? The property survey, this is, you know, a perfect segue to it, because right now we're going to have the most up-to-date data on inventory in the city of Cleveland, those 167,000 parcels. Using that and then creating a real strategy on how you advance vacant land, you can really now start to use both of these initiatives to create economic development strategies in targeted geographical areas. So does the property survey look at commercial corridors as well? It does. Okay, that's the question. Yeah. Yes, it does, right. Councilman. Tim? Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you would like to learn more about Clevelot, uh, you can go to our website, clevelot.org. We've got all the prototypes up there and information about the working groups and other events that we've held there, um, outcomes from the focus group, things like that. 
So we've done a really good job as an organization. Um, we have uh, developed over 100 vacant lot, lots in the city of Cleveland uh, and put them back into productive use. Some we've aggregated multiple vacant lots. Some it's just been a pocket park. And so our colleague Khalid Ali is going to walk through some project examples of how we took on vacant land and put it back into productive use. Khalid? Yeah, please. Matt, can you talk about also who funds these projects? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we will. Go through the presentation, then I'll answer the council lady's question at the end. All right. Thank you, Matt. All right. So again, my name is uh, Khalid. So uh, Tim and I, we work very closely with uh, residents and organizations on these uh, vacant lot projects. And um, as he explained, when it comes to the um, Cleve Lot project, um, bringing together all of those stakeholders, we're able to really think about the various challenges that might come to a, a person's um, doorstep, so to speak, um, when they decide that they want to do something on a vacant uh, lot. So this here project, the Woodhill Community Garden, um, it's actually in um, Council President uh, Griffin's ward. Um, this is a, a project that uh, we worked alongside Calvary Hill Church as well as the Buckeye Ministry and Missions Alliance um, to get done. Uh, it started out as a small church uh, garden, and um, Pastor Fields had a, a larger vision to create a garden for the neighborhood in which um, residents could get fresh produce, also learn how to farm, um, also providing a space that could be used for uh, educational outdoor um, usage alongside East End Neighborhood House and um, something really open to the public. Um, but uh, just from looking at that fence there, uh, some of the things that came up in this project was uh, a need to get a, a variance to complete the fence. Um, understanding um, the previous zoning um, restrictions as it was a, a commercially zoned, um, needing to go through a uh, review to get that pavilion placed where it is. So um, our primary goal is to, to really um, kind of bring forth those challenges and then work with our partners um, to assist uh, with those projects. The Garden of 11 Angels is another example. Uh, this was a tremendous project. We worked very closely with Burton uh, Bell Carr, uh, the residents on Imperial as well as um, local churches to really come up with a space that could um, memorialize the victims there on Imperial, but also be very sensitive to the community's needs and uh, you know, kind of um, build something that kind of showed their, their sentiment towards this incident, but also make a space that can still be utilized by the community. We, we didn't want something that was just gonna um, serve as a, a kind of a um, a sanctuary where no one could touch it. Um, we want this to be something that the community can come. Um, family members can pay tribute, leave flowers. Um, folks can stop by, read books, have cookouts, and, and really use this space and, and just serve as a reminder of how strong community can be uh, when it comes together. So this was an awesome project to be a part of. Um, these next two examples are um, not is, is focused on the um, larger kind of green space, I guess, um, designations you would think of. So side yards, again, thinking about the um, citywide survey, as well as a thing like Cleveland, we're able to really see not only what the status of commercial and residential structures are, but also the vacant lots. What are those looking like? Um, are they next door to homes that would qualify to be um, side yard owners? Are these lots um, not near a resident, but also a lot that has maybe troubled trees on it or could use more trees and can help increase the canopy in that neighborhood? So we're able to utilize these uh, tools in various ways. So this here, the side yard program, we're working alongside residents um, who are interested in side yards and really just helping, walking them through the um, the application process, and also um, in cases um, finding resources to transfer their side lots and also developing uh, their vision for what those side lots would look like. 
Our groundwork program is an example of what do you do when that lot does fall in a, in a space where there isn't a resident on either side of the, pro, uh, the property. And um, with the groundwork, what we do is we go into a neighborhood, we speak with residents, we're doing door to door, um, we're doing small community gatherings, as you can see in that photo on the left hand side. And we're really trying to gauge their interest and understanding of um, the status of the lots in their neighborhood, how do they feel about them, are folks utilizing these spaces, and if not, what would they like to see done in these spaces? So um, through that, uh, we, we collect information, we do a survey, um, thinking about what it is you would like seeing done with these spaces, but even prior to getting to this point, we worked very closely with uh, public works, city planners, as well as uh, city forestry and Jennifer Kipp on figuring out how can we make these spaces um, how can we increase the greening on these spaces, make quality green spaces that don't interrupt the current maintenance structure, um, and also can, can be something that in the future, if there is development on, on these lots, could still uh, provide that, that tree canopy and, and developers can work around those. So um, the city has been very vital in working alongside us in, in developing this program. And here you can just kind of see an example in that middle photo of what happens when we go into one of these lots where we're doing is kind of uh, taking away any troubled um, vegetation, uh, cleaning up dumping when that is there. Also just cleaning up the um, sidewalks, uh, different things like that, overgrowth onto the sidewalks. Just really manicuring those spaces, making them look good. Um, really low cost, high impact, just more visually appealing spaces. And then as you see on the right hand side, ultimately when it's time to um, do the tree plantings, um, we're getting volunteers on these, on these lots, community folks going out there planting trees. A lot of folks learn how to plant trees for the first time. Um, understanding what it takes to go into tree maintenance and then also um, through our Reforest Our City uh, program, we're also able to give trees to residents, um, train them as tree stewards, and they're able to continue this knowledge of um, trees and, and kind of carry that with them going forward. Um, thank you, Khalid. Uh, I do want to, uh, this concludes our presentation. I'm going, I want to speak to and answer the Councilwoman Santana's question, but um, M.K. Hubbard, who's our, our, our urban program administrator for the office, um, or myself, I would say contact either one of us. If there's anything that you saw that you'd like to advance in your ward, let us know we're here to support you. But to Councilwoman Santana's question, like how do you fund these types of projects? They're, they're varied. Um, this uh, side yard project, um, we did have some grant funding that we had received through the St. Luke's Foundation that allowed us to do some side, uh, uh, some interventions on, on lots. That funding has expired, so we're, I'm always looking for opportunities to, to do and advance more of this work. The thing that I really love about our team here um, is we really do engage the community. I'm looking at the council now. We're, we have projects going on in, in every single ward um, that's represented at this table right now. And um, uh, we like to engage people, make them be part of the decision tree when we advance projects. Here's a perfect example of the Garden of the Loved Angels. We all know the tragedy that surrounded it. And, and these families of these poor uh, 11 women um, who were failed by so many people, um, um, all they wanted to have was an appropriate memorial. And so we had over half a dozen community engagement sessions. And the story I love about this, our former colleague, and, and we miss her dearly, Jackie Gillum, and some of you I know knew Jackie Gillum, what a tremendous woman she was. She was leading a facilitation process where they were trying to determine the name of the Garden of Eleven Angels. And they were coming up with aspirational themes. They knew they wanted a garden. They knew that these women needed to be honored and recognized as angels. Um, they knew there was 11 of them. And so this little boy who's in the room, who's 10 years old at the time, raised his hand and said, why don't you call it the Garden of 11 Angels? And so I really love that because we try to use what the community wants to advance that and help them work with us to co-create the space that we operate in. With respect to your specific questions, my colleague Isaac's going to walk through the, the funding on both of these projects. Councilman, or uh, Through the chair to the, to the committee. Funding for these projects is difficult, and so we like to say we'll take funding for anywhere we can get it. This one, specifically, for those of you who have not 
been able to drive by it recently. It's on the intersection of Rose Hill and Wood Hill, really close to the Wood Hill Choice project. Um, it is an incredibly nice community garden. We, the reason we were able to make it as robust as it is, is through a USDA grant, actually. The USDA has a lot of money right now that they're allocating. So in, we have some key bank money, a little bit of money from the St. Luke's Foundation, as well as Habitat for Humanity. Um, but the real lion's share of this funding came through the USDA. So that's going to be around $150,000 investment. It included acquisition of three parcels from the city of Cleveland on that. To the next project, Garden of Eleven Angels. Question, oh, question yes. real quick. Isaac, uh, what USDA grant did you, do you all apply for that grant? We applied for that grant, okay. correct, yes. All right, can you just uh, get to, if you could send it over to me, I'm, I'm interested in what particular USDA grant that you all applied for that, you did, that was able to be used to fund this. Yes, yeah. thank you. I'm also interested as well. Gotcha, yeah. we'll send it out. In regards to the Garden of Love and Angels, what's really exciting about this project is that it was the first project funded by the Clean Ohio program, which is administered yeah. by OPWC, which is a state department. It is the first project in over 20 years history in Cuyahoga County to be in a neighborhood that suffered greatly from the foreclosure crisis, but also was a historically red line neighborhood. No other project had been funded previous to this. So that was, I believe, 400 thousand um, from Clean Ohio, close to $600,000 in total from a variety of private philanthropic sources as well as public sources. We got a county supplemental grant on this as well, but again, close to 600000 That takes place on eight parcels, many of which were owned by the city land bank that we were able to acquire, as well as Cuyahoga Land Bank. And now it is eight parcels that are owned by the Land Conservancy and a lease and management agreement with Burn Bell Car Development. And Mr. Chairman, this um, con about $632,000. Um, this concludes our presentation, but I, before we open up to questions, I would like um, uh, Assistant Director Wackers to just make a brief comment about just the perplexing challenge that the administration is dealing with with yeah. vacant land and then their partnership working with us on this initiative. Director. Uh, uh, thank you, former Councilman Zone. Um, and through the chair, uh, really briefly, I, I think the Cleve Lot initiative is, is really highlighted the, the opportunities that we have with the land bank and repositioning it from a reactive process where we really only considered applications and very few other proposals. Um, uh, there was no overarching strategic initiative uh, guiding the land bank. Uh, and in partnership with Cleve Lot, we're starting to put the pieces together to really uh, be strategic, be proactive, try and create consensus, so that when it does come time, or when there's an opportunity, everyone's on the same page and we can sort of move it forward quickly as opposed to the reactive process we have now, where we involve council, CDCs, the public, planning, and uh, more often than not, their timelines and their opinions uh, do not align and become more of a burden rather than an asset. Um, but I look forward to this partnership um, in the next coming months where it really comes to a head, where we will start to see some fruits uh, of the labors over the past year or so. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you to your team here for the presentation. Um, all great work. I do want to, uh, there are some members who signed up who do have some questions before you, before you head out. Uh, and we're going to start with Councilman uh, McCormick. Anybody? Thank you. Um, and Mr. Chairman, this was a really robust presentation, so I don't really have a lot of questions. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, you know, the, the blessing and curse of all of this public land in the city of Cleveland, we recently learned through um, the, uh, the lot acquisition work that the city is going to be working on, especially around you know, identifying, consolidating, and cleaning lots for redevelopment within the city of Cleveland, that something like 30% of our land is owned by a public or nonprofit agency within the city, not just vacant land, all land, right? So we, Mr. Chairman, while we know that it is a significant challenge for the city of Cleveland to own 18,000 lots, director, or she's not here anymore, um, something like, oh, assistant director, something like 18,000 lots, uh, and we know the financial burden and, and, the, and the work it takes to keep those lots up. 
Uh, it's also a tremendous opportunity for our community to own this land, right? I mean, if you look around the country, Mr. Chairman, um, and how expensive land is and how you know, sparse land is, um, while it's a pain in the tuchus for the assistant director and, and their, their whole team, um, it's a huge opportunity. And I think, Mr. Chairman, I'm so happy to see this presentation because this is the type of work and vehicle for us to start thoughtfully offloading this land from the public books and more importantly, uh, Chair, repurposing it for a positive use in our community, be it a community garden or infill development to rebuild our neighborhoods or whatever it might be. Um, but we know, as the director noted, assistant director noted, that it can be challenging uh, at times, the process, the timeline, all those types of things. So, Mr. Chair, I just want to thank you and your leadership from the policy end of council on this. Um, you know, um, Ms. Mr. Zone, President Zone, Councilman Zone, whatever, Matt, whatever we're calling him and your whole team um, on this work. I mean, this is one of those issues of our public land and how do we equitably and thoughtfully repurpose it that to me is, when you think about Cleveland in 30 years, getting this right is gonna be so critically important um, and can have such a positive influence on the community, right? Whether it is helping to bring new jobs into our city neighborhoods or community garden or inf whatever that might be, getting this right is important. So um, again, Chair, the um, presentation on the survey is fascinating, having those tools available to really understand the and benchmarking our housing stock to how do we navigate um, our, our vacant land. And I'm really excited, Chair, that the city is working with our partners in the community um, to be able to get that done because, you know, the city can't do everything, can't do it all. Um, and it's a healthy thing to look and say who are our partners in this work and how do we better work. So anyways, Chair, I just wanted to say this is a really great update from the committee, uh, for the committee, and I'm really excited to see how this um, works out because, again, um, this is one of our massive assets. I mean, we look at the blue thing behind us as an asset. We look at our neighborhood history and businesses assets, but this vacant land, although, again, a pain in many cases, also can be unlocked as a great asset. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, Matt, and your team on this great work. Thank you, Councilman. Um, anyone else? Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do agree, very robust um, conversation. Um, we learned through the pandemic that gardens and just vacant space was so, green space was so important, mm -hmm. right, for people's mental health and mm -hmm. nutrition. I'm curious to know, and I know I talked to you, um, Mr. Chair, about gardening, ARPA dollars mm -hmm. to activate these spaces. I'm curious to know, has there been a conversation with workforce and activating garden spaces and maybe stipends for people that maintain these gardens? Because um, I haven't seen any legislation mm -hmm. around ARPA dollars, ARPA dollars to activate green space, correct? Um, through the chair to the councilwoman, I, I, I can't comment on um, the ARPA dollars with respect, but what I will tell you about workforce development and the green job sector, right now there is um, so much money that's coming out of the uh, Recovery Act right now that's going to be targeting the green job sector. Um, Right now, there's not enough workforce in that space. So our organization is working with, you know, private companies like Davy Tree Resource Group. Um, they have a deficiency just in the state of Ohio, 850 uh, people to work for them. So there's an opportunity here. I know that the, the city's economic development department and Team Neo are thinking about this a lot. Um, any comments you want to share on that? But but it it, it should be um, a real opportunity here for uh, Clevelanders who want to enter this uh, area, um, I, I, think it, I think it's going to advance at some point. Good. I'm happy those conversations are happening, so maybe I will follow up with that. I mean, we have gardeners that have been asking for this for years now, and they've been maintaining it, maintaining gardens at no cost. And they're city gardens. Mm -hmm. So... Um, well, just on that point, one of the things uh, through the chair to Councilman Santana that we're working with uh, Assistant Director Marka Fields and Planning Department and, and Director Joyce Wong is could there be an opportunity to create a green community land trust? Um, and I don't know, A.D. Wackers, if you want to speak to this as well, but there's a real challenge with the community development department. They put out these temporary leases, whether they're one year, three year, or five year, yeah. and then you have an awesome community garden leader, and then that person moves from the yeah. block or 
you know, no longer is physically able to do that. And then who maintains that space? Mm. So we're at the point where I think there's going to be a feasibility study that is going to look at um, what structure should be in place to take green space that is used for agriculture purposes for um, in, in Cleveland that is land that won't be put into productive use for building a gray structure, as our colleague Tim refers to, not a, a green development, but a, a, a gray development. If it's not warranted for a gr gray development, and that land should be kept in as a garden in perpetuity, long term, what's the right ownership model? Who should own it? Who should maintain it? All the liability issues associated with that. And so there's a series of conversations that's going on. A.D. Wackers, uh, anything you want to comment on that? Uh, thank you. I, I think these type of models are all very important. I think the greening should probably encompass a larger role of activities in terms of the, the community gardens, but also the reforestation. Um, the benefits of those is also, I think, a, an opportunity sort of land bank for future time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but there are a lot of challenges and stewardship questions that really need to be solved. It is, it is a, a significant undertaking by itself. Um, we do a lot of management and troubleshooting with the community gardens as is, even with the leases. Uh, whoever takes that on would really need to be a very good steward. Got it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, thank you uh, again to you and your team for coming this morning. We truly... You got a question? Okay, Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, to the chair, to the team here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, and I guess as a part of um, the overall initiative, and we know the biggest thing is looking at resources. Mm -hmm. How um, how does the coordination happen? You know, with your organization and other organizations, as far as identifying resources, because mm -hmm. I just saw that like. Um, well, through the Biden administration, through USDA, they just sent out like another billion dollars, um, one in particularly for disadvantaged communities and tree canopies. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you all are looking at that or how that, you know, how does that coordination work usually? Um, great question, uh, Councilwoman. Through the chair to Councilwoman House, great question. Um, we're, we have a, a, a you know, we're an organization, nearly 50 people. Okay. Um, we have a whole grants funding team that is constantly looking at this. For our urban projects, um, we have a, a, somebody who's focused on this. And we have weekly team meetings that look at um, how can we build funding strategies to advance projects. The project we're working with you on behind the Thurgood Marshall Rec Center, you know, at the end of the day, that's going to be probably... 1.2, 1.3 million dollar investment in the Huff neighborhood, um, and we've raised close to 700 thousand already for that. But our team is constantly scouring for grant funding sources. Isaac, you you lead uh, some of the planning work we do. Any any thoughts you want to share on that? Through the chair to the councilwoman. One other avenue is sort of these partnerships and coalitions. So the Cleveland Tree Coalition, for example, with the USDA and the Urban Reforestation, Samir Malone is the director of that. The Land Conservancy is very involved, and that's a good way of multiple organizations strategizing simultaneously on these larger funding opportunities. Um, regarding more project specific, that's where the local partnerships, um, specifically with CDCs and council people, is really critical to work with city departments. A good example on the Huff Green Space is coordinating public grants that maybe we're not eligible to apply for as a nonprofit that a government agency has to. So working with partners in MOCAP or in public works to figure out who's the best suited partner to apply. The county supplemental grants, another good one. Community development corporations are eligible to apply, but we're not. The Clean Ohio grant, conservation organization, conservation organizations are eligible to apply, but CDCs are not. So it's sort of having this matrix and being like, hey, you're eligible for this one, we're eligible for that one, I'll come together for one common common goal. Okay, and th just a follow up through the chair um, to the team. Thank you for explaining that, and I'm assuming there's just a cycle of connection with the city of Cleveland in particular, because I know many times our um, 
resources are definitely spread very thin when it comes to, you know, many of our departments don't even have, don't have a grant management team. You see what I'm saying? To write grants, things of that nature. So um, really looking forward to hopefully us leveraging the dollars that are out here to make much needed investments here in the city of Cleveland. And through the chair to the councilwoman, if there's ever a need for public grant writing assistance, you know, that's again, I think an area of expertise for our team that we're happy to partner with on these green related initiatives. So we, we offer that as a, one of our services as well. Good to know. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one thing that was, was asked about, uh, you know, the administration is putting forth $50 million for job site acquisitions. You know, um, those job sites means nothing if these neighborhoods are in shambles, mm -hmm. right? You know, yeah, if that's the goal to get people here and then to leave the city and go mm -hmm. back to where they live, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But we need to put an equal focus on, uh, you know, acquiring and enhancing a lot of these vacant lots in the city of Cleveland as well. Mm -hmm. So I know one thing that's been discussed is maybe an RFP through the Community Development Department mm -hmm. for areas that has these large stretches of land, mm -hmm. you know, to go out as we did for the, the, the school sites and try to generate interest mm -hmm. uh, for single family home developers, mm -hmm. multifamily, specialized uh, housing um, populations, you know, throughout the city of Cleveland. In addition to that, also uh, providing interventions on some of these lots as well, because mm -hmm. not every lot, uh, there's something that needs to be built on. You know, having public green space is very important within these communities on these streets. Mm -hmm. I never really liked a street that just, just. I mean, you gotta have one lot or something that, that there's some sort of green space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen streets where there's like virtually no street trees, no tree line trees. Mm -hmm. You see some that's in the back of the houses, but then all you see is houses, concrete and asphalt. Well, that doesn't look good, right? And it doesn't feel good. And then, you know, we know that um, the statistics say that you have to have or you should have uh, areas where green space is, is, is live and well because it helps with your overall health uh, as, as, as humans. So uh, one of the things that I'm going to be looking at is how we uh, put together a pot uh, using these ARPA dollars mm -hmm. to do just what the administration is looking to do regarding mm -hmm. job sites, but do that in communities and for communities. Mm -hmm. So I know that we've had a conversation uh, yeah. before, but I very much intend, and I hope they're listening, and the council leadership is listening, that we, we need to take this step forward and begin to look at how we, we do that. Obviously, it is going to be a part of a larger conversation with CD and overall plan mm -hmm. of how we uh, adjudicate more of these mm -hmm. lots in a way that really supports and help our communities um, so again thank you for your can I make one yes. brief comment um, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point mr. chairman um, as I said in my opening statements we've done over a hundred vacant lot interventions mm -hmm. in the city of Cleveland in fact one of the biggest impediment to advancing a project like this um, is just having resources uh, because it's a burden sometimes to residents, you want a high standard of what the aesthetics of a vacant lot intervention looks like. Well, you need funding to do that. And so um, I'm going to ask my colleague Tim to briefly comment. We're going through a second round of funding now. Fingers crossed that we'll get this funding from the US EPA, but it will allow dollars then to do interventions on vacant land that aren't in high pressure markets, That's that right. aren't subject for right. infill housing development, but yet the people who live in that community, they deserve a quality green space as well. So Tim, could you speak to that please? Sure. So um, for the second round of funding, we're looking to leverage the work that we've done through the uh, current UJCPS grant um, and partner with uh, neighborhood connections or neighbor up and fund small grants through their funding mechanism because it's a community sourced um, and community determined process for determining which projects get funded. And then the Land Conservancy can provide technical assistance to applicants uh, to help them create sustainable and uh, cost effective improvements to vacant lots in their neighborhoods. We'll also be partnering with the FAIR project on that too. All right. Listen, all great work. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. will for sure be in touch once you finish your, uh, this, once the survey is complete and all the quality control is done, we'll come back for working session so that members of this body can um, get the full understanding and be able to understand how the system connects with the entity. All right. Mr. Chairman, should I send the information about the USDA grant? Should I send it to, to you, Joe. Mr. Titron? Me and, and then me and Mr. Titron. And, okay. And, we'll and then you'll get it to the members. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank your time. You, you stay. Okay.
All right, Jeff, come on up. No. Is he coming up too? Ordinance number 397-2023 by Council Members Harrison and Griffin by Departmental Request, an emergency ordinance notifying Council of the final budget allocations received from HUD for the 2023 Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnerships Act, Grant Emergency Solutions Grant, and the Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS Grant, and to amend Section 3 of Ordinance number 135, 2023, passed March 20, 2023, relating to the grants. Director. Thank you, uh, Chairman and members of the committee. So. Obviously, the, we have went into a deep dive in February regarding our annual budget. Um, you, that public hearing is always based on the uh, uh, estimated amounts, but the actual uh, programs and, and projects that we are going to be working on implementing starting June 1st when the fisc uh, grant year starts. Um, we have received our formal awards. I'll have um, our budget manager. Uh, Jeff Kucharski sort of summarize um, the the awards and the sort of the changes um, uh, that are arise from that. Jeff, uh, thank you to, to the to the chair to the council people. Um, the community development block grant our estimate was twenty one point one. The actual allocation came in at about twenty point seven. Home and investment partnerships uh, estimate was four point nine came in at uh, actual was 4.5. Emergency Solutions Grant uh, estimate was 1.9 and uh, came in uh, pretty much even, flat. And Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, 2.1 million and came in higher at 2.4 million. Uh, net, net, overall, um, it was about $40,000 more in the aggregate. All right, thank you. Um, anything further, Director? Uh, so if you look through, the, you'll see the other changes. Um, there's a significant cut in the program, uh, department admin requirements. Um, and then based on where we had available opportunities to cut, you will see that there's a reduction on the NDA line item. Um, that is really also looking at in the aggregate of all, our, all the funding that's available. Um, the unencumbered free balance funds, over 67% that's currently um, not being used, 67% uh, of that is, is uh, from Councilmatic uh, NDA uh, program funds. So while this is a, a cut to your overall budget, um, we really need to see that amount uh, be spent this year. Um, we we'll look forward to next year and trying to reco re recover that uh, for the council. All right, so let me make sure I'm clear. I know, I understand this is a very... So, okay, so the, 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 the annual NDA fund that council members uh, receive, you're telling me that's being cut? So there were two line items that are being cut. Our the department's budget, so our staffing and, and, and ability to administer the grant, and then the uh, NDA amount, which is the council allocations. The reason for that is that of the seven million that you receive every year, there's a significant amount of money that is still available to council, um, maybe not particularly to yourself, but to other council members, to a total tune of um, 11.7 million. Um, that's a year and a half of available funding to council, even before we add in this new money. Um, if you look at the overall budget, those are the two areas where we can cut, our department budget and the council's budget. So what you're saying to me is that because there's money that's left unspent, you recommend not, so what, are you not, the 437000 per ward so is not being. Uh, it's uh, a modest decrease of, um, I think it's a little less than 5% per council person. It, so it's it comes around. out to the, through the, count, through the chair of the uh, committee, it comes out to about 23 per ward, 23000 per ward. Reduction. So reduction of 23000 um, uh, per ward uh, from the 437, whatever. Right, and I, I really need to stress this is a, a bigger issue in the council. When, when we add this 7 million, there's going to be 18 million across the council members in the NDA fund for this coming year. That is a significant amount of money that's hampering the city's ability to be timely on its spending on grant funds. Um, if I make cuts elsewhere, um, 
that's essentially a cut to programs that are spending their money timely. And this year, I have to really stress that the council has $18 million. Um, and and we need to, that, that problem needs to be addressed. The first step in solving that problem is to cut it uh, in this budget and then get council people to spend their money that they do have so we can get that number to a reasonable amount. Well, what I disagree with you that, that the first step is to cut the budget in order to address that problem. That's not the case. You know, like I know, Director, that it takes a very, 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 very long time to get contracts through. In fact, I don't think CD's accepting any new contracts other than the normal PIFs that we provide to the CDCs, which that was my understanding, Mr. Titron. Uh, he's not here. The, uh, the most recent understanding, right? that that was the case. So law department, we've, we've heard many times from, so it is not just about where the council intends to, uh, we're not spending the money because part of it is, it's like why even uh, go through the hassle? You kind of wait for a project to come that you can utilize it because it's so hard to get these contracts complete through CD and the law department. So as we've heard just about casino funding, there's many times that council members uh, want to fund something through casino, then there's issues through the law department, there's issues with the process. If funding has been allocated, but it takes so long for it to get out the door. We, we saw the, 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 uh, the egregious errors in those numbers that we've seen with, um, with the casino funding. So, you know, I, I wouldn't put it all on this body to say that it is us who is the reason uh, that it's not going out the door. There is some Foster's ownership line. and accountability that will come from the, the department and not only CD, but other departments in the, in the, in the administration as well, and all right? So to say that we are going to cut as a start in order to get that money out the door, that is not the right way. What I would suggest that you all have done is come to this body before this was introduced, and I may hold this today. Please is hold to, uh, to have a conversation with us about how do we help, how do we best support the body in order to get these money out the door? Is there something that we can assign a, depart a staff person in our department to help review the, uh, the request or, or what you would like to do? How do we best, uh, you know, draft these and get them out the door and work and find a particular person in the law department to help push this stuff out? So through the, through the chair, um, for the 11.7 million that's currently not, um, that continues to be a balance on the NDA program. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any PIFs for that money. Mr. That, Chairman, again, we, you, you get to the PIP part once there's an understanding and there's an agreement that this money can be used in this way or that the department believes they can get it out or there's a belief, a belief between this body, the law department, your department, council staff, that this actually can go forward, right, in the timing of that. Some of it is timing. There may be a need to quickly get this money to a project, but it don't happen. Uh, because we know that it just won't, it won't get through the process uh, in the time that we would like for it to get to the process, or the particular project may need it to get to the process. And I'm sure my colleagues are, go, as, are ready to weigh in uh, as well on, on potential reasons why uh, there is a, uh, a balance in some of these funds. Now, granted, there, there's some uh, who have neighborhoods that has to build up these reserves in order to have a, a, a larger impact on a particular uh, uh, upcoming investment or opportunity, you know, uh, in their neighborhood because there is no other discretionary or no other funds being targeted to these communities in a way that members have been saying for years. That is the whole reason why we have been talking about the need to change this, the way uh, we fund CDCs, to, to change the way that, that uh, we fund uh, all these other activities that we like to do or that Community Development Corporation needs or, or just these projects need because these block grant dollars just aren't it, right? That's one piece. The other piece is timeliness, how we get these through the process through the city of Cleveland. Uh, we'll open up to the committee for questions. It's Councilman Joe Jones. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I'm one for holding a piece of legislation um, to pop this in front of us and then try to make us wear the jacket uh, on the um, slowness and lethargic lethargic department that has been lethargic and slow for quite some time since I've been sitting here at this table. And I got $150,000, Mr. Chairman, that's been sitting up in your department, Mr. Wackers, uh, under Mrs. Jackson's in the housing. And you've been going through meetings with it and meetings with it. And I don't see no reasons why it should even be in your department anyway, because you're too slow. 
And for three years, we've been trying to get this money out here to help the citizens, senior citizens who need roof repair work done, who needs exterior work done, and, and your people don't even have the dignity or respect to call me and tell me why you still got it, hold it up there in the first place. Now, when we sent our initial monies, Mr. Chairman, and we allocated like $20,000 to that initial program under um, John Analifo uh, and his, his program, we were able to get out and help a lot of people. And we only used a small amount, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Wackers, and when we went and took that same program, they said, well, since you have more money into this program, and by the way, Mr. Chairman, this is not block grant money, because I don't like block grant money. It seems the way Cleveland has put a yoke around that money and made it so difficult for citizens in the city of Cleveland to use that money. That's the reason why we're in the problem that we have right now. And your department has failed to get its programs out and efficiently. For an example, if you have a shop program, and you have inspectors in the program, and they go out there to take an assessment to the program, then those citizens, Mr. Chairman, are looking for your people to come in within that three to six months after they've been taking a full assessment, told them what they're gonna give them, versus dying on the program and not getting into the program two or three years later. And so I could go up and down, but this one here hurts me, Mr. Chairman. And I want you to hear this one because this is crazy here. Why would you hire a rookie contractor to go out and, and do work that they've never done before and then have four different inspectors go out on that project and then come back? And Mr. Chairman, here's what gets it right here. The poor lady got into the program to get assistance and help with her home. And at the end of the day, what happened was she got a lien put against her house, being in the city of Cleveland's program. So when we talk about competency and capacity and capability, uh, Mr. Chairman, your department has a lot of work to do. And you need to hire capable, competent people. And you need to fire the ones that are not doing the work. Now, when council gives you the resources to do the work that we're asking you in a respective way to do it, and it takes two to three years, and I still don't have the program, that's a problem. And when my local development corporations have to run all the way around to Cancun, Mexico, and back in order to get the funds expended out, that's a problem. When it takes six months, Mr. Chairman, for a local development corporation to actually get a contract out of the city of Cleveland, that's why you have money that's not spent. So my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, we should really look at this department and start talking about where is the bottleneck in this system and how do we fix, fix these knots here. So I'm not sure if Mr. Wackers know how to do that, um, but they know they got a problem up there. Why can't we just start taking a hard look at this and having a special day, Mr. Chairman, on this issue? Because this issue and subject matter on block grant is one that's contentious with council. And a number of members have said that maybe we shouldn't be using this money at all. I tend to be in agreement with it. And I'm on the notion of Mr. Kerry McCormick, who made the comments in the past about using general dollars versus block grant money. Because right now, when this department changed in the 1990s and put the program in place to go to CD development corporations versus doing everything in-house, uh, and then not consistently supporting those development corporations, we have the mess that we have right now. So my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, is simply this. Let's reevaluate how we're funding our, our communities, and then let's look at, because regardless if we use this pot of funds or we use another pot of funds, if we have to go through uh, community development, we're going to still have the same issue that the director is bringing us to us now, saying that we got $17 million unspent, because they can't get the money out. Not that we haven't allocated it. They can't get the contracts going, they can't monitor them correctly, and they don't have the systems in place to really do the business we're sitting here, and that's the reason why our neighborhoods are drying up. That's the reason why our neighborhoods are drying up on the east side for, certain, for sure, because they don't have the developmental capacity economically to do the work, and they're being redlined at the same time. So Mr. Chairman, I would say hold the peace,
And then let's come back and have a summit on how we're going to help them staff up their department to get our dollars down onto the streets to help our citizens. Because if we got the money and we can't get it out there to help the people, what good is it? What good is it if we can't get that money out there to help the people? And that's why, Mr. Chairman, they put uh, this money in place to help poor people in the city of Cleveland. And yet we carry the distinction of being uh, one of the poorest cities in the nation. And we got this money coming in year in and year out and can't get it down to the street. That's a problem. It's embarrassing. I have no further comments. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Spencer. Yes, Mr. Chair, I also would be supportive of holding the peace today. However, um, just as a technical point, I'm not seeing in the ordinance could, through the chair, could the assistant director or Mr. Kucharski point out where these proposed cuts are within this ordinance? I'm not even sure I'm reading it properly to see where it is. It's on page four. It's on page four. <clears throat> but the general administration and then um, neighborhood development grants. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, and, and then, all right, Mr. Chair, I do support holding the peace today. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman. Listen, and, and I'm not upset that you have to cut because you're cutting the administration side as well, right? Because obviously the pot came in lower than what we expected from the, um, from the, from the federal government. So the pot is smaller than what we initially received, you know, but my biggest concern is is to walk in here and tell us the you know we're the burden that that's where my real problem is right is I'm, I'm i'm concerned about the cut and that's something that you don't control that is something from the federal government if they are giving us less money then we have to make the hard decisions but again my issue is coming in here and telling us that part of your basis of cutting the nda part is because the money is left unspent right well is that, all, is that also the basis for cutting administration? Because there's a lot of grants started at Jeopardy within the department. There's a lot of stuff that is, money that is unspent in the department, right? There's a lot of things in the department that ain't getting done as well, right? And I didn't hear that out of, out of, out of the team here about why you all are cutting the administration grant. Well, that was the, the, but your reasoning for the NDA was because it's not getting out the door because of this side of the table. Well, to the to the through the chair to the committee, uh, it really was. The block grant was three about three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars less. We received for over last year, um, rather than piecemeal it across a ton of programs. This really was and Occam's razor sort of decision based on current funding available and what was available going forward. In that department. We could certainly piecemeal it across those. That'll take some extra work. With regards to general administration, we are limited by HUD to keep our administrative expenses to 20%. No more. We, and right now, we bump up against that pretty much every year. Right now, we're at about 19.6 until May 31. So we really have to watch our administrative expenses to not go over that. If we go over that, we have to peel back some, we have to pay some of that back to HUD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that, is that? No, that's that crazy. crazy. I get you. So, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. clarification, you're saying to me that you can only use 20% of the funds for your administrative staff, and then Correct. of those 20%, do we, we, we used, uh, uh, general dollars in order to fund the rest? Or we don't use no general dollars at all? Uh, through the chair of the councilman, there's this, there's some general fund that goes towards, I believe, three positions. Uh, fair housing, um, consumer affairs, and there's one more, I'm sorry. Right, it's it, we need it's to the use stipends for the committee on the fair housing, so it's not even staff within the department, then consumer affairs. And um, that's really, that's all. Oh, there's uh, the, the paint program manager. Um, that's correct. And yes. then all the other dollars are really for programs, such as community engagement, healthy homes, the paint program, and legal aid, um, though, where those really don't pay for administrative costs. Um, so, so how much would it be, Mr. Chairman, if to the director for administrative, what is the administrative cost number if we was able to swap that over? How much would it cost us? Five points. Well, I, 
So well, four million is roughly the admin costs that we're charging for admin of the grant. For the whole thing. Your, all your people in your department, Mr. Chairman, are all under black grant is what you're telling me. With the exception of three positions. Right. So, so Mr. Chairman, I think that this can be a good fix here. Um, it's not something that we can't sit down and hash out in terms of general dollars. It would also give us flexibility in programs that uh, we don't have flexibility into because they're saying, well, since our staff is block granted out, there's only certain things we can and cannot do. Hmm. Um, so I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, we even look at how we, we restructure this entire department. If we want to have an efficient and effective department, we have to see what works, what doesn't work, make suggestions, sit down with the mayor, and then talk about how we use general fund dollars. We have ARPA funds, and you know I'm a candidate and investing back into ourselves. And so I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, we look at this in a multifaceted approach. Change this department this year so we won't have to continue to go down this route where all of our projects are being bottlenecked in. Understand and uh, what's happening through our processes, because before we didn't have uh, John James and Tony Tell that did this work for us years in past. We had people from out of the department that came down and helped us with our resources. So my suggestion, is, and this is to Tony Tell and, and John James, listen, I'm not trying to take your job. Um, I love you guys, but here's what I'm just suggesting is that we relook at this so that we can stop this bottleneck process because all of my programs and all of my stuff is, is held uh, up to six to seven months, up to a year before I'm able to get right. that onto the ground, and that's what's causing me to have problems in my neighborhood. Uh, Thank you, through, Councilman. Through, uh, if I may com comment on that through the chair. Um, so I, I would agree with that. Uh, I've only been here two years. So kind of a fresh, unbiased perspective, having, alleviating some of the pressure off of block grant and allocating general fund dollars to a portion of our general administration would relieve some of the pressure and allow us to expand, do more in terms of distributing so, extra dollars. I mean, so through the chair, just to add on to that. That's obviously the department's not in charge of the city's budget or the city's general fund. Uh, that's a conversation mm -hmm. um, that exists with m more than just who are at the table today. Um, but to the, the councilman's point about the department is a change, that's, that is true. Um, the director has, is actively um, looking at what that will look like this year. We have had reviewing a number of different options um, with the goal of presenting something to the administration June 1st um, with implementation by the end of the, the calendar year. Um, it is what we're having on the table is, is a significant change and one uh, obviously we'll pull in the council um, when needed because it will be hopefully in the benefit of every, everyone but also will be a requirement that everyone understands how this is going to work going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councilman Jones. I mean, you know, it's, it, I would love for ha us to have done this this past budget, but we all agree that we would, you know, use this year to figure out the best ways to uh, change some of the, the issues that we've been experiencing with CD, you know, that it was too late in the game to just shock the budget this year with that, but looking at next year's budget to figure out where we can move and shift and and, uh, and, and, and change the ways and where we allocate uh, funding, um, whether that's through uh, neighborhood development grants, whether that's general administration from the department, whatever it is. So, you know, th this committee, as you see, is, is very much uh, willing and, and ready to continue those conversations and to uh, have those thoughts. So uh, we look forward to those uh, happening very, very soon. Um, again, as I said, I get the feds themselves cut the actual amount that the city of Cleveland receives. So there is, there is the, the, the reduction somewhere is inevitable. It has to happen, right? And I hear your rationale that you, you chose to cut from a set of the programs versus the administration itself and the, the grants that are given to council members. So I, again, I hear you. And I've, I won't go into it again, but I've shared with you my concerns on the way you presented this and your comments this morning, which, uh, which um, clearly didn't sit well uh, with me. And to get this here as you walking in without any, any, um, any other discussions outside of uh, this, you know, 
uh, is, is, a, is a concern of mine as well. Councilman uh, McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. Um, it, the comments have already been made that I agree with. Um, first and foremost, I'm against us cutting our CDBG budgets a penny. I think that's foolish. Um, these are critically important dollars that I utilize for everything from my CDBGs to social service and beyond. Um, so I just want to put that on record. I don't think we should remove a penny out of our ward allocations. Second thing, Mr. Chair, I would just say, I'm going to give a 30-second story on this. I would just advise the administration to just stop with this rhetoric of council not spending money. It's not true. It's unhelpful. It's complicated. Let me give you one example. There's the issues of the law department and CD taking two years to get contracts done. I just signed off on a 2020 uh, allocation um, that we started three years ago. Um, but the other piece are projects in the, and I'm looking at our director back here and our commissioner, um, where we're actually working together. There is no issue between the administration or myself, but a project is taking a long time. West 20th Street director, it, I have to hold money in my account for a project that exists that the city's working very hard to figure out. It's really complicated. It's an alleyway. The director is, you know, probably loses sleep at night because I harass him about this, but he's been an incredible partner. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a project where there's actually no holdup at the city. It's just a really complicated project, but I have to hold the money in my capital account so that when we arrive at the solution, no. I have the funding in place. So on paper, that money is quote unquote sitting, but we have a project and we're just troubleshooting it, how to get the darn thing lined up so that we can invest in the project. So again, this rhetoric of council not spending money, again, I think there are issues within this, no, I don't think, I know there are issues within the system of us physically getting it out, but also there are nuances like that where that money on paper is sit sitting in my account, but there's a project lined up that I'm working well with the administration to spend it down. So I just find that language, and, and Director, I would say across the system, just really unhelpful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Harsh. Thank you. Uh, through the Chair to uh, Assistant Director, I'm just trying to understand the discrepancy in the numbers here. Um, the uh, legislation mm -hmm. on page one, uh, it seems that the t difference between the 2023 estimate and the 2023 final allocation, the only difference is a $329,000 reduction in CDBG funds, whereas home, ESG, and HOPWA all went up. That's correct? Jeff? Uh, uh, HOPWA <clears throat> certainly went up. There's been a concerted effort by the federal government to increase that, mm -hmm. that, that program. Um, uh, and... The others went up marginally through the chair, but yeah. they did go up. Well, oh, yeah, last sorry. year we had, a, I think, a $200,000 increase, and this year is a $6,000 increase. Um, the home numbers, I, mean, I don't have them directly in front of you, but there's an increase there. It doesn't mm -hmm. surprise me. There's been an increase uh, in shifting resources to home. Right. Um, and, and, and this, I think, also shift is a flow Congress's um, appetite to really invest in programs that have shown uh, accomplishments over the years. Home is really good at developing affordable housing, and mm -hmm. there's really more of a need to, to do that. And so the only cut in here, if I'm seeing this correctly, is in the CDBG allocation down 329,000 and some odd change. So then my question then through the chair to the assistant director is when you scroll down um, to, I don't know, I guess section four neighborhood development where you've got the total allocation, it's a loss of 3.5 million. So what I don't understand through the chair to the assistant director is why the discrepancy between what amounts to a, a, a simple reduction of 329,000 on page one turning into a reduction of three and a half million um, under section four, and where does the rest of that money, um, why, why is there a difference in, in accounting? So, uh, through the chair to the councilman, um, off the top of my head, I don't know which line items we, we sought to increase in the budget, but there were certainly increases. In, in some areas, we're trying to preserve those. Um, in looking at the sort of the overall operational budget and seeing what funds we had from prior years that were not spent, you know, the, the, the 11 million out of the 17 that is not being, that has not been allocated for projects, um, 11 came from the NDA program. That just seemed like the logical place to start in considering. I, I'm Cuts. sorry, I, I, I got lost. I mean, all, almost all of these final allocations are reduction that amounts to a $3.5 million reduction, but the 
amount of funds provided to the city is only a $329,000 reduction in one category. That's what I'm confused about. Why, why the dramatic reduction when we weren't actually reduced that much? Through the, through the chair of the council first, and the, if we go to the estimated 2023 allocations, the first column. What number? Yeah. There were, there were, what page? We est it's all of them. The entire first column on each page. It's, it's a column, it's okay. multiple pages. There were uh, economic estimates, or estimates based on economic conditions, you know, particularly the inflationary environment. When we got our final allocations, uh, Congress did not take that variable into consideration. So they were significantly less. So then when you look at the end, you see 3.30, you know, roughly 34 million down to 30. Mm -hmm. That 33 million included our estimates based on uh, using variables of economic conditions. Okay, so through the chair. Uh, so what we did was we <clears throat> overestimated Correct. Uh, more dramatically than uh, the increases that the government actually finalized. Correct. Okay. So the final in, uh, increases in the final 2023 allocation column that totals up to $30,455,201 is the actual number that we're receiving through HUD for all programs combined. Through the chair of the council, that's correct. And through the chair, the number to the left of that is higher because those are our estimates that were off. That is correct. Okay. That I understand. Um, well, the first, well, I believe through the chair, uh, the first page doesn't have a total allocation amount, but it should, if we were to add all these up, it should equal the 30 million. What was the point of allocations, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Councilman. What was last year's allocation? Can you just do that real quick? It, it was 20, uh, yeah, about 21, 21.2, $365,000 more than 20779 So we had $21 million last year versus the $30 million we received this year? No, through the chair of the councilman. I, no, I thought you were talking about block grant. Overall, I, I don't have those numbers in front yeah. of me, but I, I can get those. No, I have it. So last year was $21.1 million was awarded. Um, <coughs> yeah. And this year, what is the total? 20.79. 20 million, 779, 240. And, Mr. Chair, do you have just another quick question as we're, as we're sitting here trying to just, you know, make sure we fully, fully wrapped our heads around all of this? Um, it's still the estimation error accounts for a lot of this, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, but, but the, the 2023 estimated amounts on page one is, actually comes in under 30 million, um, whereas the when you total the columns starting on page on the 10-year housing plan, they come up to 33. It seems that the 2023 estimated amounts in the four big pots of CDBG, Home, ESG, and HOPWA adds up to 29 million. Um, so th there's a discrepancy there that I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, uh, Be between the total estimated amounts on page one and page four. Like we, the, even, even the estimated amounts changed. Uh, through, the, through the chair to the uh, council person, there's uh, likely program income or prior year funds included in the 2023 allocations on the following. Yes. These are pure grant. On page one, these are pure grant numbers. Yeah. So that, that's correct. So section one is really to accept those funds from the federal government. You've already accepted other funding, um, such as program income or um, un unused allocations that are being reprogrammed within the budget now. But you, in order to reprogram them, we need council authorization to put them in into another bucket. And, and, and that's what the 30 million is. So we probably have taken programs, say, from public services that might be left over. Now we're going to throw it into, uh, say, maybe home repair. Um. Okay. And then that, that 
also very helpful. I understand it. And I would just point out to my colleagues then that that seems like there's only a $4 million discrepancy in what's been unspent in the whole city. Divide that by 17. <laughs> if, if we were to all have an average, we'd have a 235,000. That is the discrepancy that we're having. And I think through the chair, that would be good for us to have a come to Jesus meeting um, where the administration could lay out how much money they think we have um, and how much money they think is sitting around in our ward accounts. And we could talk about how much money we've allocated out of those accounts that we have actually considered encumbered um, and money that's already been spent spent in our head, um, and we can actually get to the bottom of this, because uh, 235000 per ward uh, would be a bit of a, an accounting uh, nightmare to try to figure out, but we don't see that money sitting in our account because we've allocated it, and we, in our head, it's spent, and it would be lovely to get to the bottom of this. Through, uh, through the chair to the councilperson, that's the missing variable as we track the NDA funds. We, unless you formally put through a PIF, we don't see what you have allocation. If you have a, and a million dollars in your ward mm -hmm. and you've got it earmarked a half a million, we would not know. But mm -hmm. to add on to that, though, I think the the balances are not shared equally among the council. This is very true. That's a very good point through the chair. They're not mm -hmm. shared equally. It's not that everybody has 235000 unaccounted for. I'm just using round numbers and, and, and simple math. but. Uh, it is about a $4 million discrepancy, and that's, that's an important number for us to understand. Sure. Councilman Thank you, House. Chair. Yeah, just to add to this point to the chair, um, this is one of the reasons why we really need to have um, some type of OPA system on tracking data. Um, we actually really, you know, you're setting up objectives and things of that nature. None of this should be done in isolation. Um, this is a federal allocation to the city of Cleveland, and we actually should be having benchmarks, goals, things of that nature to assess ourselves. The administration, all of us, it's not just one or the others. This is the city of Cleveland. We're supposed to be able to move things forward, and so I think this might great create a good opportunity to have a working meeting to kind of go through these things as we're trying to, you know, even for myself coming in, I'm trying to scramble how you do this, how you do this, and it has been um, a bit challenging to see, say the least. Um, and, and so I think if we could just take a moment to actually have a real working meeting to go over these things so we can align our efforts, um, I think we will all be better served and the city of Cleveland um, will be better served. So. That's my suggestion as far as holding and well, thank you. Uh, one, one quick comment, too. As, uh, uh, through the chair of the committee, we, you know, we provided, uh, one of the things I did when I came on board was provide dashboards for all the wars on what was spent, how much you have available, spending goals. Uh, there's been little change since we were here on the estimated numbers, so I would refer you back to those. If you want updated Dashboards um, can certainly provide those to you at any time. Can so, I just to add to that mm -hmm. to the chair? Yeah. Um, thank you to the chair. Regarding those dashboards, again, I feel like those are. It tells you what has been spent. It doesn't tell you what are we trying to accomplish, right? So I, I have received a amount of over several administrations and it just says this is what's been but what did we accomplish you see what i'm saying so that that for someone like myself coming in i'm trying to figure out well what was our objective what were we trying to accomplish and did we uh, achieve what we said we set out to do and i think that is a piece at least for myself that is missing yeah. um and i really think that we have to just have some better alignment in that area just putting information out um, to say this is what we did and not having the other part of accomplishments. For me, I, I think it's challenging and, and, and hard to share the story. And I think that's where some of this level of conflict is coming in. So thank you for that, though. Thank you, Councilwoman. <clears throat> and I know everyone has had a chance to, uh, who, like, who wanted to weigh in, has weighed in. Uh, clearly, there's some, uh, there's some concern here, and we need to do some more. We have some more conversations around this. So as the chair, I'm going to hold ordinance number 397. It will not pass today. I'll reach out to the department, and we'll get together and have some discussions, and we'll engage other members uh, as necessary. All right. I'm Madam Clerk. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I appreciate um, you holding a piece of legislation, but just okay. want to just restate that the system is broken and it needs to be fixed. So this is not a situation with just the, the one-off legislation. If we're gonna shock the Overall, system, yeah. we need to shock it this year. Yeah. We need to be smooth moving. 
uh, when 24 and 25 get into play. Yeah. And, and my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, is that the administration is lacking in a number of areas, and one of them is staff in order to get the funding out into the into the neighborhoods. Another portion of that could be potentially um, the law department not having the proper staff in place mm -hmm. to process these contracts. All of these things are hurting our neighborhoods, hurting our local development corporations to their core, and has put some development corporations out. Yeah. And this is not indicative, Mr. Chairman, to the gentleman that's sitting in front of us today. This is a long-standing issue. This is one of the reasons why I've had a problem with the previous administration, because he was a, he was a councilman. He should have known better on the issues that hurt us the most at the table is not being able to get funding out into the community to really help our people yeah. and our citizens in need. So this is a critical thing here that we're doing, and I just don't I just don't want this to just be smoked off the table. This is something that needs to be dealt with and dealt with firmly yeah. so that we can have a stronger system in play to really truly serve our citizens. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, so we'll follow up and we'll get with you, you know. Um, you know, I, I know you, I know you, we've been working together, so I don't take it too personal with the comments, but we need to, we need to, um, we got to figure some things out. We got some discussions we need to have. Um, moving on, ordinance number 396-2023 by council members Harrison and Griffin by departmental request and emergency ordinance authorizing director of community development to enter into an agreement with CHN housing partners and or affiliates to provide emergency rental assistance to qualified uh, residents. And just remind everyone, it is 11.46. You know, some of us have 12 o'clock meetings and appointments, so let's be mindful of that as we go through um, these next few ordinances. Director. Thank you. So this is a uh, amendment to a previously um, allocated general fund um, allocation for rental assistance. Um, there is uh, a, a key a critical partnership between the city of Cleveland and, and CHN and, and the deployment of rental assistance funds over the past number of years. Um, a significant amount of funding has been able to flow through CHN from the city, but also the county to benefit uh, Cleveland residents. Um, CHN can sort of give a high level uh, overview of what those numbers entail, but it's tens of millions of dollars. But those federal funds are now coming, uh, are, are winding down. Uh, programs have been sort of, uh, are shifting. Um, and one of the shifts that we are going to see and, and still provide residents some uh, um, ability to get more stable housing is how we can deploy these rental assistance dollars um, uh, in, in the absence of the federal dollars now. Um, I think there's a cr critical component here is that why were these funds not spent uh, when they were allocated? Uh, in 2021, uh, the real reason was that th these were flexible dollars. We had um, real tight time frames with use of federal funds. Um, and uh, the focus was really on making sure that those federal funds get into the community. Um, we now have an opportunity to uh, sort of shift, um, and those rental assistance dollars really were a hard stop, but the need is, is still ongoing. Um, and this federal funding, real, this local funding really helps reinforce other initiatives that the council has funded, specifically right to council. Um, while it's great that we can provide right to council to families, um, if you don't provide the other tools that can solve their predicaments, um, uh, that, that will only solve part of the problem. And I think this is a, um, uh, hopefully they'll touch on their partnership with right to council and legal aid as well. Um, but there is a need to really, uh, an opportunity here to invest these funds um, and, and really create more stability. Um, as other programs such as more affordable housing inventory comes online, um, as the counties and city partnership and homelessness uh, implements a new strategic plan, uh, these are good dollars to help bridge uh, a number of different um, uh, opportunities that are coming into the future. So with me, I have Lori, uh, I always get your last name, Bustiani? Bustani. Bustani. Uh, and then another CHN employee here that uh, Lori will, Laura will introduce. Thank you, Director. Um, of course, I get the shortest check. Right. Um, thank you, Director, and good morning, um, members of council and chairman. Um, we are very proud to have uh, partnered with the city and Cuyahoga County on the rental assistance program uh, that served the community during COVID. Uh, the program 
uh, was able to deploy $100 million nearly uh, between all the various sources uh, throughout the city and the county, serving something like 22,000, 21,000 families. Um, over 22,000 payments unduplicated for some folks who came back uh, with remaining assistance. Um, the need for rental assistance in Cleveland has always been there. COVID relief dollars were kind of a gift, but a sorely needed um, pot of money, and now those are wrapped up. So uh, as the director says, said, we are um, hoping to continue some sort of rental assistance in the form of housing navigation and first um, security deposit uh, and some landlord incentives, but uh, there's no, there are no other sources of dollars, especially to support right to counsel. So this is, a, this is perfect timing for this, even though it was held for a while. It's, it's, we really need it now to support folks. And Nina, my colleague, Nina Holzer, is the director of economic of financial mobility for CHN Housing Partners and a former City Hall employee, so she can speak to it in more detail. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'm happy to talk about our housing navigation program and, and our goals for the program. Um, so uh, at a high level, the goal of the program is to help renters secure safe, stable, affordable housing through housing navigation services and rental assistance. Um, our navigators would work one-on-one -on -one with renters, connect them to potential landlords and units, advocate and assist renters as they apply for housing, um, and support those renters post-move in case there is any additional assistance that they need in order to um, thrive in place and maintain that housing. Uh, eligible renters will also have access to rental assistance in the form of security deposits and first three months rent. Um, we would also have some limited landlord in incentives if needed um, for for lack of a better term, hard to house folks who might have something on a, on a background check, poor credit, something that is keeping that landlord from wanting to uh, move forward and, and sign a lease with those individuals or that individual. Um, Again, the motivation behind this work is that uh, in the absence of emergency rental assistance, so as we move out of pandemic era dollars, there really is a gap. We still get calls for service every day for rental assistance and have some limited pools of dollars, um, small, small restricted dollars that we can <coughs> tap if folks have uh, school-aged children. Um, but otherwise, we don't have any rental assistance dollars to point them to. Uh, we also see this as a big opportunity or a, a good opportunity to leverage the landlord database that we were able to create over the course of the administration of ERA dollars. So we have relationship with, relationships with landlords that we'd really like to leverage, um, and this is a great opportunity for us to um, leverage those relationships and connect folks to, to available units in the city of Cleveland. Um, and again, finally, we see this as an alignment with right to counsel. So we still work very closely with legal aid, but again, unless a client or a tenant qualifies for our very restricted pools of pool of money that we have um, through our family stability initiative, um, we don't have rental assistance to point folks to. So um, this, again, would be an integration and alignment with our right to counsel work. Uh, so that was very high level. I don't have a nice PowerPoint, uh, but if you have any questions, or I'm happy to get into the nitty gritty of administering the pro or how we envision administering the program, um, I'm happy to answer any sure, of those go questions. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you, if you want to provide some additional context on how uh, you intend to <coughs> administer the, uh, sure. uh, if we support the redirection of these funds. Yeah. So. Um, we are planning on still using that neorenthelp.org as our front door. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, again, was the platform that we were using for emergency rental assistance. Many folks are familiar with, with that platform. And so we would use neorenthelp um, to intake applications. We would also um, we would look at folks who are being referred to us through our Family Stability Initiative or through from legal aid. Uh, we would pr our housing navigators would pre-screen um, folks for eligibility. So we're looking at, and I'll, I'll pull up my scope of work. In order to qualify for the program, folks would be at uh, would need to be at 
80% or below area median income um, and confronted with some sort of hardship that is causing them to be confronted with some uh, with housing instability. Um, unlike emergency rental assistance, we wouldn't be screening fo our potential tenants uh, for COVID hardships, which is a big departure from emergency rental assistance. We do see folks coming to us now wanting this assistance. Um, or it, we saw clients over the course of the pandemic needing assistance but not being able to attest uh, to a COVID-19 financial hardship, and so that was a big barrier. And so with these dollars, 80% AMI um, or below, some sort of issue that has come up that is leading to housing instability. Um, and then from there, our housing navigators would work with them one-on-one, -on -one, leveraging, those, leveraging those relationships that we have with landlords, um, helping individuals search for housing that meets their needs, that works within their budgets. There would be a case management element of the relationship where we're looking at their budgets, spending plans, making sure that whatever housing we're connecting to them to um, would f uh, fit within their, within their financial picture, um, and then helping to negotiate as they're working with landlords. So again, um, let's read through your lease. Let's make sure you understand the scope and terms of your lease. If there is something that the landlord is concerned with when it comes to someone's background, do they have an eviction history, whatever it may be, we would also have those landlord incentives to tap. Um, and then hopefully, if we're in a position where there is a successful move, we would be checking in with them 30 to 60 days after to make sure everything is going well. Um, do they have what they need? Are there additional services they would benefit from? Um, we're also hoping to make sure they have that relationship with legal aid in case there is a tenant's rights issue, um, or if they are having an issue with their landlord, they know the, the process um, to put their dollars in escrow, whatever it may be. Um, so again, so again, there would be an element of um, both providing that rental assistance, but providing more wraparound to, to help folks as they are, are seeking to move um, and, and identify a new home. Good. Thank you for that. And I know that oftentimes folks find themselves and really are forced to just take any situation or conditions that they have at the moment because they need to get off the streets or they don't want to be on the streets. And it really puts them in a tough position. Uh, and once they get there, they realize, wait a minute, what did I do? And, you know, if they tried to leave or begin to save their money and, and put down on another place, then here comes the eviction, right? Because you can't pay in both places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I see this as a way to assist people to get them out of uh, bad situations that they may have uh, quickly took, you know, uh, uh, took, you know, because they didn't have any other situations or anything else available at that moment uh, for them or their family. Um, again, I see this as a, a still a form of rental assistance, but supporting individuals in a different way um, versus our, you, you, you missed your rent, you need help, you apply, we pay your back mm -hmm. rent for you, and you're back on track. But this is giving, as you said, a wraparound effect uh, to be able to support the uh, tenant in the households um, all together. So thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Director, can you briefly, before we go to the committee, can you just jump back to the funding that this is uh, as part of funding that we initially had authorized in this ordinance today, uh, you're asking for us to uh, change the allowable uses of the dollars, uh, and this is not a new set of uh, monies, correct? Oh, that is correct. Uh, through the, to the chair and the committee, um, so this is general fund dollars uh, uh, approved by council um, I believe in 2022 uh, mm -hmm. uh, was part of the reconciliation of the budget. Um, it was an amount of 4.5 million or 4.5 million um, for the purpose of rental assistance to go into uh, the rental assistance program that CHN was was performing at the time. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, uh, the city received a sort of the ERA two. Uh, which pay priority to spend that money. Obviously, the county received that money as well. Um, these were dollars that were always sort of envisioned to sort of follow on the tail end of the rental assistance one. But the surprise of rental assistance two and then the success of CHN's program um, allowed for uh, special allocations because other part communities in the country were not able to um, effectively get these dollars out. And then the state of Ohio uh, also could not find other Put, uh, competent partners throughout the state, and really, I think, um, you know, I don't know how many it was. Right, 40 million that they ended up submitting to the city. 
Uh, 55 came back to the county and the city total. Yeah, 55 million. Um, so it's really a testament to the ability that CHN has really been able to work quickly and using these funds in a very challenging environment um, for people who are really facing, you know, life and death crisis situations being adequately housed and being forced or potentially evicted onto the street in a time of a pandemic. Um, that's a lot of knowledge base and, and um, capacity that has been built up, um, which I think this is really a, a wise investment. Um, but also, CHN is taking the lessons learned. Um, and I think shifting this program from one to really um, uh, uh, alleviating back rent and really finding ways to best stably house these families. Um, uh, housing that is too expensive for them will always be too expensive. Um, but if you can relocate them and, and give them housing navigation and other services, then uh, we were probably creating a better situation for all those involved. And sure. that will ultimately have a benefit of not impacting our homeless uh, systems, other social services, um, and even just quality of life uh, challenges, food assistance, making the choice between paying for food and rent, uh, utilities and rent. Um, I think this is really an opportunity. Uh, that that solves, you know, it really focuses why housing is so important. You need to get that right first, um, and then it's easier to tackle the other issues. Sure. Thank you. Um, one question to CHN. Have you all addressed the, um, the concerns and the issues that you all have heard yourself and members have spoken to you about and just the general public about being able to connect uh, in a timely manner uh, with a staff to or, you know, contacting the folks back, you know, be able to reach somebody on the phone. Have, have you all staffed up in those areas? Have you addressed the staffing issues or concerns that have been raised previously with uh, folks being able to actually access the resources? I appreciate that question, Councilman. Mm -hmm. we, um, we have, uh, but just to make sure everybody's aware, the, the emergency rental assistance program, the COVID relief federal dollars, those expired in, in December, so there are no new applications. The, the, what we're speaking about, I think, now is the extraordinary situations where there was, um, uh, there were clients who weren't uh, communicated with in a timely manner and that sort of thing as we were closing out the program. So the program is now in the very final stages of it being closed out. And, um, and most, I think, about 100% of the checks of the payments have gone out. The only, um, so yes, we've addressed all of them. The only unusual thing we can still address at this point is if a check didn't arrive because of, it got lost in the mail, we could reissue a check, that sort of thing. But the program has wind, uh, winded down and, um, you know, we did have to staff up quite significantly to deploy $100 million. And at the end of the year, unfortunately, we lost that staffing. Uh, so the closing out of the program in terms of communicating with clients wasn't ideal and we take responsibility for that. Yeah. But this is a much smaller program, uh, 4.5 million as opposed to nearly 100 million. And we've always had some capacity to do this, but of course these dollars are gonna give us more capacity. Okay. Uh, just to add on to that, so while the staffing, you know, I think you use temporary staffing. You guys can adjust when, when needed to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. um, but what you have invested in and developed is really a, a, a technology framework um, and a, a knowledge base within CHN to really deploy these dollars uh, effectively. Uh, and this will only allow us to continue to benefit from those investments and that knowledge. Absolutely. We literally just have to turn back the, the website live. and. Um, it's very simple to get this moving again. So they can apply to the website, someone gets it. Neorenthelp.org. And, and they right. reach out to them uh, mm -hmm. to talk about assistance. Right. And as you said, Chairman, we are, our goal is to make sure these folks are successful mm -hmm. tenants, not just um, you know cover rental arrears. So this program has much more of a wraparound nature than the emergency rental assistance program. I believe in you. I believe in you. Uh, Councilwoman, um, Spencer, Santana, and then Jones. Okay, go ahead. Just on your point, Mr. Chair, um, Laura, through the chair, Laura, um, you mentioned a grant finish in December. Mm -hmm. Was all that funding allocated or was there some leftover from that grant because of capacity? 
Oh, oh, capacity was not the issue. Time was the issue at that point, uh, at the end of the year. We, uh, I believe we allocated most of the dollars, if not all, that were contracted with us. Okay. So I can't speak whether the county had dollars left or the city has dollars left somewhere else. But as far as what CHN was contracted to deploy, yes, that was deployed. You deployed everything. Mm -hmm. okay. As far as I. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through the chair, I just want to recognize um, Nina Holzer's award, 15 resident. Always exciting to have residents at the table. Um, I wanted to clarify then with this $5 million um, program, do, would we consider this to be the end of rental assistance, right? Because I, I had been telling residents there is no rental assistance uh, do, dollars. There are no dollars available. The COVID assistance is ended. So through the chair, is this is this kind of the scraping the bottom of the barrel, or is this, what is, what are these dollars? Um, through the chair, this is kind of rental assistance 2.0. This is what uh, sort of program we probably always needed in this town and never had. And now that we've built, uh, like the director said, the knowledge base and the infrastructure technology wise, we can uh, now do this. But this is a new pot of money for this new, uh, for a new purpose. It's not, it's not the same as the old purpose. So, um, yeah, emergency rental assistance, it's done. Yeah. COVID relief is over. This is a new purpose. This is for housing navigation and, um, you know, the more wraparound services, not just rental arrears. Right, I think I understand that. And then, so I guess through the chair, how, how long would, is this five million projected to last? So how long will this, how far will these dollars stretch? Through the chair to the councilwoman. Um, again, a very good question. This is, we think the need far exceeds this amount. So uh, there may not be a, a big effort on our part to market this program because through the um, right to counsel, I think it's going to be used up quite quickly. So we will be looking for more funding to power up this new system that we're creating. Great. So I, I think we'll look forward to just getting further updates. But if a, if a resident knows about NEO rent help and they reach out, someone will Of course. We're going to see answer, if they qualify under the new qualify. program. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. And it's so important to be able to help people who certainly are in a need um, and then be able to deliver the product and the services to them. Um, looking at this program here, and I, it, it's somewhat the questions I have is the previous program, in addition to hearing what my colleagues have said about this one here, it seems like you're going to spend this funds uh, pretty quickly. Um, with the COVID, uh, and the funds that helped uh, in the city of Cleveland, how much did we, we, we give out uh, for um, uh, housing assistance as it relates to rental? Uh, to the chair, uh, through the chair to the councilman, in total from the various pots of money that came to CHN, so the city, the county, even some utility assistance funding, and then the clawed back funding that the city sent back to the city and the county, we're close to a hundred million dollars, and and I, and the reason why I bring that out because I'm I'm bracing myself right now, and I'm wanting to kind of like get an idea of what this impact looks like now that this program is out. How, how are we looking or paying attention to um, uh, uh, people being evicted out of their properties in the city of Cleveland? And, and, and since this fund is no longer in existence, what does that look like? So to, to the chair, uh, to the councilman through the chair, we have always been concerned about that. And um, I am not an economist, and I, I can't speak to this, but a lot of uh, our folks have said that the emergency rental assistance program kind of distorted the market a little bit. Uh, and now we're back to almost nothing. So we are very concerned about it. And we, we you know, this fund is just to start. Uh, there is a huge need otherwise, and time will tell, but we're very concerned about it as well. Is this somewhere, and then this is it, Mr. Chairman, and then we could do this offline. Um, is there, to the administration looking at this, because this is going to be some important. We just got through talking about, you know, how we have all of this technology put in place of, 
of seeing what houses need to be rehabilitated, what's an A to an F grade house, and what are the possibilities for economic development, all of that, right? So are we looking on the administrative side to the profound impact? I know that a number of business people have come to me concerned about uh, their survivability because a lot of these funds are now dried up. So are we paying attention on the administrative side of, of, of all of these programs that are now drying up after the COVID? So to the chair and through the, to the councilman, I, I think there's, a number of ways we are trying to pay attention and, and respond. Um, the, f the first, when we're looking at rental assistance, we, you know, if we're not doing an adequate job or don't have enough resources to address it appropriately, um, you'll see it pop up in, in a number of different ways. One, you'll see more evictions in the housing court, so we depend on legal aid to really uh, monitor that, um, and uh, they give advice to the city as, as a result. We also look at the continuum of care and, 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 and the fluctuations in the type of homeless people, the type of homelessness that people are experiencing. Are we seeing more family homelessness? Are we seeing more um, chronically homeless? Are we seeing youth homelessness? And uh, that is really done in a collaborative effort with uh, around 30 different partners on de deploying either short-term assistance, short-term shelter, um, or permanent supportive housing for the populations and what their sp special needs are. Uh, and, and the county is, is, is um, wrapping up its strategic plan, uh, which I think was really timed well in terms of how, what this is going to look in a post-pandemic environment. And then just more generally, we know the deficit of affordable housing in the city of Cleveland and that 65% of renters are, are really um, have, are of a high housing cost burden. Um, and that is really troubling. Uh, it really indicates the potential for significant instability into the, in the near future, which would ultimately ripple into evictions and, and homelessness. Um, the good news is that we are looking to try and bring on a thousand new housing units, affordable housing units in the near term, um, and maybe up to uh, 3,000 um, by the end of 2026. Um, but that is all. These are bigger problems. Uh, CHN can't solve them. The city can't solve them. Uh, legal aid can't solve them, but hopefully together we can start to be more strategic and, and, and deploy resources in a way that makes sense for the benefit of residents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to distinguished gentleman. No further questions. Thank you, Councilman McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm asking these on behalf of Councilman House. Um, she would like to know to the panel, um, where's information on demographic stories, socioeconomics, family status? So do we have a picture of who has received um, these resources. She's coming back in, so she wants yeah. to ask them herself. So, to, but do we have that that picture or uh, I'll, the, the I'll information? I'll ask CHN the comment as well, but overwhelmingly what I've seen in, in the rental assistance, but more importantly on the pandemic assistance, they've overwhelmingly gone to household turning um, really 30% or less uh, of area medium income, so those are most in need. Uh, and they're predominantly being accessed by people of color throughout the city of Cleveland. Um, I don't know if you have more specifics up top of your head. I don't have more specifics at the moment, although I'm happy to follow up with them. But at every point of the program, we tracked all those demographics and uh, something like 75 to 80 percent of the rental assistance recipients were African American in, on the east side of the city and many were single, head, most were single heads of households. But I, I'm happy to follow up with more. So through the chair, thank you. And thank you, Councilman McQuarrie. Um, through the chair, um, to our guests here. So the reason why I'm asking this conversation is if you can actually provide the mm -hmm. um, holistic information, um, I actually would like to uh, see more more in depth if people were working people, you know, our working families, to actually understand who are the employers, right? What type of things, these are the things we, to We begin. have that data. We, we, and again, having the data, but sharing the information so that we as a body can truly understand economically what is happening in our society mm -hmm. so that we can begin to have conversations on a much broader level specific specifically with employers to understand what policies need to be made to change to change the trajectory of people and understanding where this is happening in our city this is how we can change the system but if you don't have the information is you think is an isolation but there are things that probably can be revealed to us mm -hmm. if the information is shared from yeah and through the chair I do want to you know, give accolades to CHN. They actually have the dashboards. Uh, it's all geographically mapped. They can uh, do it by zip code, census tract, neighborhood. 
Um, they can break it down by, the, by ethnic or income. Um, and then we've even asked in terms of, you know, we wanted to know early on to, what type of landlords were benefiting from this program. Was it just multinational corporations um, or was it the mom and pops? And they were able to give us a list of everyone who was, was mm -hmm. receiving that and overwhelm. I would say two thirds was really the mom and pop type of landlords that you're talking about. And at the end of the day, those are people who are now able to pay their property tax bill. There's, those are people that are able to make sure that um, their property can be kept up to a certain standard. There's really a virtuous cycle here in the CH, in this, um, this rental assistance has really, uh, you know, helped create a floor um, in, in some ways during the pandemic uh, for a whole variety of, of, of public need. Right, so through the chair, um, to I guess the specific, the specific request is if that information, um, what the information that you have, if you can share it, definitely citywide, but even possibly breaking it down by wards ish mm. or mm -hmm. zip codes ish, because I know how it, like data imps or maybe even census tracts, uh, so that we, if there are ways and opportunities for us as a council to look from a legislative lens uh, to see what policies that we may be able to put forth to, to better support our families um, so that they can be more stabilized. Absolutely. I will just caution one thing that most of the data is self-reported by the client. So in terms of sectors of uh, employment and that sort of thing, I would take some of that with a grain of salt because it's self-reported and there was no way to really verify it. But we'll share everything we have. But that's a whole other. That's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other. I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Just note that in yeah, the. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Councilwoman House. All right. We'll see no further questions. Ordinance number 396-2023 stands approved. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, moving on. Ordinance number 251-2023 by Councilmember Spencer, Bishop Harrison, and Griffin by Department of Request. An emergency ordinance authorizing Director of Capital Projects to accept a gift for real estate from the NRP Group LLC or, de or his designee for purposes of planning, de designing, and in constructing a trail to connect the Cleveland Lakefront Bikeway to Herman Park. This has been heard in municipal service and properties and approved, and I believe the Councilwoman is in support of this piece. Um, thank you to your team for being so very patient with us uh, this morning. Um, and we'll turn it over to you. Um, no problem, Mr. Chairman. Would you like me to go through a long or a short presentation? Short. Long. Oh, <laughs> 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 That's good. Uh, let me. <laughs> <laughs> so this ordinance allows us to take a donation of property from the NRP group, and I'll just start by saying that this has been a goal for the neighborhood for many years, and um, Commissioner DeGenero will um, give us some details on the project, but she worked with the NRP group to get a donation of this property, and what it's going to give us is a connection between um, a housing development and Herman Park. Um, from uh, a bike trail to Herman Park, from another part of the neighborhood to Herman Park. So it's really all about connections. All right. Uh, good afternoon, That's Mr. Right. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Suzanne DeGenero. I'm the Commissioner of Real Estate for the City of Cleveland. Um, the, the donation of this property will allow, as the director said, a trail connection between the Cleveland Lakefront Bikeway and Herman Park. Um, the Property to be donated is permanent parcel number 002-10-046. It's an old rail spur um, that kind of curves, starts at the northerly portion of Herman Park and kind of curves around on the east side of West 65th Street um, and connects to the Cleveland Lakefront Bikeway to the north and also connect the bikeway connects into Edgewater Park. Um, the piece to be, so the rail spur was actually original originally acquired by NRP Group, who developed um, the Edison apartment building and residential development on Breakwater Avenue, um, and they wish to donate a piece of it that will allow us to continue that connection between the, the, the bikeway and Herman Park. Yeah. Um, it's a longtime neighborhood goal, and it'll create a very nice connection for the neighborhood. 
Right, I recall those comments from our Municipal Service Property Committee a uh, long time ago, the connection of this piece and that it was being donated by NRP. And they sh I think you all showed a, 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 a visual of the little, mm -hmm. was it pink or orange that you had highlighted that showed the connection between the two? Yes, sir, and it should be, it should be on your tablet. In the I'm tablet sure, as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, Councilwoman Spencer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, goes without saying that I'm fully supportive of this. I'd like to express my appreciation to Commissioner DiGennaro for transacting this, negotiating it with the developer. Uh, the, the improvement is not funded yet, so we don't know um, when the improvement will be made, but this really sets the stage for the, tying together Herman Park with the bikeway, so fully supportive. Thank, Thank you. you. Seeing no further questions, ordinance number 251-2023 stands approved. Ordinance number 282-2023 by Council Members Griffin, Bishop, and Harrison by Department of Request and Emergency Ordinance authorizing Director of Capital Projects to enter into a maintenance, inspection, and repair agreement with and to issue a permit to the City of Cleveland Foundation, not the City of Cleveland, the Cleveland Clinic Foundation to encroach into the public right-of-way above East 89th Street by constructing, installing, using, and maintaining an overhead pedestrian bridge. Director. Um, this is also uh, passed and heard in municipal service and properties as well. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so this is for uh, to authorize an encroachment permit mm -hmm. for um, an overhead pedestrian bridge. Um, and anytime we have um, overhead pedestrian bridges, we also uh, enter into a maintenance agreement um, with that entity. In this case, it's Cleveland Clinic to make sure that they um, do the inspections and maintain that bridge. Um, and this would be for um, an aerial encroachment over East 89th Street for an overhead pedestrian bridge and walkway connecting the existing, they call it the MM parking garage to uh, the west um, with a new Neurological Institute building to the east. Um, and this would be about 60 feet long, about 20 feet wide, and about 20 feet off the ground. Got it. Thank and you. Mr. Swartowski can answer any detailed questions we have. Gotcha. I remember you showing us a, a visual mm -hmm. at the municipal service meeting, what it looks like. This is not uncommon. The clinic has many of these uh, pedestrian bridges that connects their different uh, uh, buildings and areas of expertise from coal to heart to uh, yep. neurological, all kind of other services in the buildings that they have. Uh, Councilman, this is in President Griffin's ward. Uh, did he, he is, has he consent uh, with support? Uh, yes, sir, he is in uh, support and has signed a consent. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions for the committee? Seeing no questions from the committee, ordinance number 282-2023 stands approved. All right, thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Good stuff, we learned a lot today. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> See y'all. All right. Take care. Good job. Thank you.